So hey guys. This is your favorite fiction domain. So in this video, we will see what if Naruto had ancestral powers of the sage. But before we start, remember to subscribe and like this video. Now let's start. Hanada Hayuga opened her bleary eyes to find herself being lowered to the ground by a set of vines that seemed to have formed a cocoon around her. Observing her surroundings, she saw hundreds of other cocoons release shinobi to the ground much like herself. As soon as she felt the cracked earth beneath her feet, she activated the Byakugan to find him. It didn't even take her a second. In an instant, she was able to find his and Sasuke's chakra signatures a couple kilometers away, along with a chakra mass of epic proportions. With worry in her heart, she rushed to the heart of the battle without a single hint of hesitation. The Hayuga princess weaved through various shinobi all dazed and confused. A few saw her move towards the area of the final battle and followed her. Naruto, just wait a little longer, we're all coming to help. Ain't this nostalgic? Kiba grinned from her side as he was accompanied by Akamaru. Team 8 is back in action. Kiba, Akamaru, Hanada smiled brightly, you didn't forget about me, did you? Shino joined Hanada on her left side while adjusting the goggles he always wore. You're all safe, Hanada said with relief. The duo nodded while Kiba pointed behind them, and we're not alone either. Behind Team 8, the rest of the Konoha 11 weren't too far away from them. Shikamaru, Choji, Ino, Lee, and Tenten were the literal head of the pack along with the Five Cage. Behind their leaders, the remainder of the allied shinobi forces followed not a hair's inch away. There was not a single shinobi who wasn't prepared to sacrifice themselves for the sake of repaying their debt to him. The man who had stolen her heart, Naruto Uzumaki. Everyone's all together again. Hanada murmured in awe. Hey, we can't let Naruto hog all the glory forever. Kiba smirked while Akamaru barked in agreement. Just as Hanada made to reply, an earth shattering and ear deafening explosion rocked the earth from the area they were heading to. The gale force winds created launched a large amount of shinobi back while the stronger ones were able to stand their ground. Hanada covered her eyes with her arm while her hair flew back wildly. Through the gap in her arm, she looked forward only to confirm her biggest fears. The chakra signatures belonging to Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha were gone. An unknown space darkness. The encompassing black void wrapped around him like a cocoon. He couldn't see anything. He couldn't hear anything. And above all else he could not feel anything. His limbs were nowhere to be seen while there was no way to look around without his neck. Despite being lost in an unknown space, Naruto Uzumaki could only feel a great sense of accomplishment and pride. Naruto and his teammate Sasuke Uchiha had beaten Kagaya and sealed her away forever along with Black Zetsu. It was a grueling battle, one that took hours with many close scrapes with death. Kagaya, the progenitor of Chakra, was an enemy like no other. The goddess was able to open pathways to different dimensions, and almost succeeded in trapping Sasuke forever. If he was honest, the duo would have lost if it weren't for the timely actions of Kakashi and Sakura. Yet despite existing as a being of near endless power, Kagaya still had an even greater ability. The all-killing ash bones. A mere scratch was more than enough to completely destroy a person's body on a molecular level. Naruto knew what the ability was capable of firsthand. Obito Uchiha only smiled as his body fell to ash after he had saved both Naruto and Sasuke's lives. Thanks to the former Konoha shinobi's sacrifice, the team was able to seal away Kagaya for good. After the Uzumaki and Uchiha sealed away Kagaya, the Jubi fell apart soon after. That was the last thing Naruto saw before there was a flash of light and then darkness. Naruto felt nothing before his vision slowly returned as he blearily blinked his eyes. Where am I? Naruto wondered looking around. Am I dead? The blonde shinobi asked himself. Not completely. An elderly voice replied. Naruto turned around to see the legendary creator of Ninshu, the Rakuto Senen Hagoromo Atsutsuki. The old sage wore a white robe with nine black magatama surrounding his collar and back. He sat on nine truth seeking balls and held a staff across his lap. Hagoromo wore a small smile upon his weary visage as he watched the blonde youth. The Jinchuriki of the Kayubi took the opportunity to observe his surroundings and was surprised that they were now standing on water or in the sage's case floating above water. Oddly enough, the scenery reminded him of when he had first met son Goku after the gorilla ate him. 
Of course he was able to make the gorilla vomit him out, but that was a new experience in itself. Ah, good times. A reminiscent smile appeared on his face as he recollected all the horrible and disgusting events he had been subjected to in his lifetime. My life really has not been great, but still. He wouldn't have traded those experiences for anything else in the world. His first mission C to a rank mission where he ran into Haku and Zabuza, his rivalry with Sasuke, his training with Jiraiya, his meeting with Nagato and the Akatsuki, they were all precious experiences that he wouldn't trade for anything. You have beaten the Jubi, sealed away my mother, and have saved the world. You are truly worthy of the title, Child of Prophecy. Hagoromo spoke in a grandfatherly manner. Disrupted from his inner musings to hear the sage's congratulations, Naruto could not prevent the smile that made its way across his face. It was nothing I couldn't handle. The shinobi gave the sage a thumbs up as well as his signature grin. The sage's disposition fell at that statement and he sighed knowing what he had to do next. Naruto during your last battle. The explosion of chakra killed you and Sasuke, Hagoromo solemnly said. Like he had anticipated, Naruto's expression turned ghastly white while shock had yet to fully hit him. For the blonde Jinchuriki, it was like the old sage had cast a spell. Just as he had regained his senses, it was as if they were mercilessly ripped away once more. The sage waited for the information to sink in while Naruto's heart sunk upon hearing his words. The blonde shinobi's face contained a mix of emotions anger, sadness, but a strange sense of calm. Strangely, he couldn't find it in himself to scream in anger or curse the world. All he felt was acceptance as if subconsciously he knew that he couldn't change his situation this time no matter what. Naruto's entire posture seemed to drop as a mirthless smile replaced his previous grinning one. So that's it huh? I'm really dead? What happened after the battle? Naruto weakly asked. After you survived the battle, your former teacher and fellow pupil both survived the blast. The people who were imprisoned by the Mugen Tsukuyomi have all been freed. You saved them, Naruto. Naruto's mood slightly improved upon hearing the good news, but remained in despondent silence. And? What about Sasuke? The silence between Hagoromo and Naruto was palpable. It existed as an invisible fog between the ancestor and descendant. The first son of Kagaya cleared his throat before finally answering. Sasuke Uchiha has chosen to move forward. Naruto's blue eyes slowly widened in disbelief. Sasuke. Gave up. Hagoromo nodded before speaking once more. He was the last of his clan and he informed me that he no longer possessed any ties to the elemental nations with you dead as well. Naruto punched the watery surface which was surprisingly more solid than it looked. A mirthless smile spread across his lips as he stared into his own reflection. He looked completely worn, the tiredness of his gaze a reminder of how brutal his final battle had been. His clothes that Jiraiya bought him were in tatters. His jacket was practically torn in half, his pants barely held on, and a mesh undershirt was his last line of defense. That bastard's always going ahead and doing what he wants. Soccer is probably going to be pissed. He chuckled with an air of melancholy. There's a reason why you're still here. The sage continued. The elder's voice held a tone of hope to it as Naruto's gaze looked upwards to meet his own. I wanted to offer you another chance at life in a new world considering your current one was spent fixing the mistakes of an old fool. Naruto was surprised by the offer. A new life? He tentatively asked. The sage nodded and tapped the bottom of his staff on the water's surface. The ripples created altered the endless bottom into a live image of a vast land. Towns, mountains, forests, numerous objects were shown. It was as if Hagoromo had used Gara's sand eye jutsu to peer into an entirely different world. This place is known as Earthland. It is a world similar to our own except with a difference. Chakra does not exist but standing in its place is magic. Magic like those parlor tricks in the elemental nations? No, not like that kind of magic. Hagoromo amusedly chortled. The magic the people of this world use allows them to accomplish feats similar to ninjutsu. Manipulating the elements, creating runes, or even transformations. The possibilities are endless over there as they're here. Naruto was left in silent awe. Not only was he being granted a once in a lifetime opportunity, but a chance to actually live his life, but. Old man, I. I don't know if I should go, it's just. What are you waiting for? Naruto's eyes widened upon hearing a new voice while Hagoromo chuckled knowingly. 
Don't worry about us. A distinctly familiar and female voice added. Those voices. No way. Naruto slowly turned around, hoping with all his might that he hadn't hallucinated those voices. Turning to look behind him, Naruto's hopeful gaze met two different pairs that he had only gotten to see on very rare occasions. Mom. Dad. Appearing in a blue, long-sleeved shirt and a pair of black pants, Minato Namikaze looked the same as ever with his trademark blue eyes and yellow hair. Standing by his side, his wife Kashina Uzumaki wore the same green dress that Naruto first met her in as the bright smile adorning her features could put the stars to shame in terms of radiance. Standing both proud and elated, the two forms of Minato and Kashina approached and embraced their precious son. For the first time in 17 years, the Uzumaki family was reunited. Naruto could feel them. Their scent, their warmth, it was everything that he had dreamed of growing up alone. Happy birthday, Naruto. His parents congratulated through tearful eyes. The hell, you're gonna make me cry too. Naruto sniffed. His arms pulled his parents even closer not wanting to let go for even a moment. I made sure to eat a lot every day. I made sure to bathe every day like you asked. Warm tears began to sting the corners of his eyes while he struggled to keep his voice together. I slept a lot too and I made friends. I had a little trouble but. Shish. It's okay, Naruto. We're both proud of you. Kashina hushed gently stroking Naruto's hair. Her vision was blurred by the tears that were already falling, but she didn't care. Kashina simply continued her maternal ministrations as held her baby boy close. You truly are a kind child. Minato softly smiled. It's okay to be selfish, Naruto. You've spent too many years of your life worrying about the well being of others, so it's time you worry about your own. But you guys, we'll be waiting for you with open arms only after you've lived the life we couldn't give you. Kashina gently spoke, soothing her son. The fourth Hokage and his wife released their son, who wiped away his tears with the sleeve of his jacket. Hints of redness trailed along the edges of his eyes but the smile he sported was as bright as his mother's and the confidence in his gaze mirrored that of his father's. I guess I'm not ready to move on yet, old man Hagoromo. Naruto said with a wry laugh. I want another chance and this time I'll make sure to live each day the way I want to. Hagoromo smiled and nodded approvingly. The whiskered shinobi turned to meet his parents' eyes once more as both father and mother held onto one of his hands. Guys. Before he could ask what they were doing, a scroll appeared out of thin air before it was grabbed by Minato. The former Hokage of the Leaf created a seal on his son's wrist as the scroll he was holding disappeared with its creation. The black lettering of the seal disappeared without a trace leaving Naruto utterly confused as to what just transpired. Those were the Fuinjutsu I was able to master in my lifetime. Hopefully you'll be able to learn from them before creating sealing jutsu of your own. Minato chuckled with slight grin. From his mother's hands, Naruto watched as chains of gold with a white glow emerged from Kashina's palms before entering his own. While he half expected it to be a painful process, the chains entered without a hitch before he watched the final link disappear into his body. The Uzumaki were known for three things. Kashina began with a mischievous grin. The first was their red hair, the second was their longevity, and the third was their fuinjutsu. There aren't many people who know about the fourth trait the adamantium sealing chains. Unfortunately I can't pass down my hair color to you, but the least I can do is pass on our clan's renowned jutsu. Naruto was left stunned, he felt a great deal of gratitude, but he also felt undeserving. Is this really okay? He chuckled jokingly, at this rate I'll be a spoiled brat. And you'll always be our spoiled brat. Kashina giggled placing her hand on his cheek. Listen to your father, Naruto. Be a little more selfish with your choices. Ah, oh, but don't be too selfish now. I don't want my son turning into a rotten apple, you know? Kashina continued to rattle off a mental checklist of reminders and do's and don'ts, yet with each rule spoken her frame began to tremble and her voice began to fade. An arm belonging to her husband wrapped over her shoulder, soothingly stroking her back as Minato tried his best to ease his wife's heartache. Naruto wiped his eyes and laughed giving his mother one last hug as he felt her tears of pride wet his cheek while her trembling began to quell. I love you mom. I'll be fine on my own, okay? I promise. You better. Kashina managed to whisper as she struggled to contain her sobs while holding on to Naruto for dear life. 
Her baby had grown up so much in the time she last saw him, and it broke her heart to know she would not be able to see him again for a long time. Gradually loosening her hold, she felt the warmth emanating from her son fade as he let go to have one last exchange with his father. Clasping the hand that was hanging by her side, Kashina interlocked her fingers with Minato surprising him. Sorry, it looks like I didn't give you much time to talk with Naruto again, huh? Minato simply smiled and shook his head, instead choosing to hold on to Kashina's hand tighter. Facing Naruto's steady gaze, Minato grabbed a hold of Naruto's shoulder, the strength in his grip and firmness of his expression an indication of how proud he was. Naruto, my advice as your father is mostly the same as your overprotective mother. Minato spoke with a fatherly chuckle. Just make sure to find someone as amazing as her, okay? Naruto laughed mirthfully, wiping the stray wetness stinging the edges of his eyes before nodding much to his mother's embarrassment. I will dad, thanks. Turning to the last occupant of the room who had been quiet out of respect, Naruto, features brimming with conviction once more, faced the sage of six paths with an expression mimicking that of his past reincarnation. If that's all, I think I'm ready, old man. An amused chuckle escaped the elderly sage as he raised a single hand indicating he wasn't done. I apologize for the delay Naruto, but there is one more who would like to speak with you. One more, Naruto mentally repeated, who else is there? As his way of answering, Hagoromo tapped his staff onto the watery surface as one massive being materialized out of a golden light. His predatory eyes glowed with the deepest crimson red imaginable while nine flowing tails swished in the air behind him. Although the being had the form of a kitsune, he had the upper body shape of a human complete with five dangerously clawed fingers on each hand. Although the last time the Uzumaki saw the creature wasn't too long ago, the first son of the sage, Kurama, had managed to double his size as he completely towered over his former jailer. K. Kurama, seeing as it was finally his turn, the strongest of the nine biju gave a vulpine smirk towards his partner. You know, I'm a little offended that you didn't ask if I was okay, Naruto. I shouldn't have to worry because don't you reincarnate even if you die. Details, details. The fox carelessly shrugged. Naruto lightly chuckled to himself. It was quite nostalgic being able to talk with Kurama again. Back then, the large fox was completely hell-bent on taking over his body. If someone had told his younger self three years ago that he would befriend the giant fox, he would have laughed in their face before giving them the bird. He couldn't help but smile remembering his journey through life with the chakra incarnate by his side. Their tales and adventures would make quite the story if it was written. Hey Kurama, he quietly greeted. I guess this is goodbye, huh? The Kyubi blinked doing a double take. I'm coming with you. This time it was Naruto's turn to blink. What? The Biju simply smirked displaying each razor sharp canine in his mouth. After all, someone has to keep you out of trouble. I don't want my partner dying because he didn't have me with him. What are you talking about? I can handle myself just fine. Naruto argued as he stomped to confront his partner. Did you forget who decided to graciously help you when Obito had seven biju on his side? Kurama boasted daring Naruto to argue back. Graciously, it was either me, him, or the end of the world. You only had one option. Naruto and Kurama both growled at one another, Naruto's forehead pressed against Kurama's snout as the pair were mere seconds away from brawling. Their spat was interrupted by the sound of Kashina's sweet-sounding laughter as well as Minato's concealed chuckles. The pair looked towards one another before redirecting their gaze back to the pair of laughing parents. What's so funny, what's so funny? They said in unison. It's just that you two make an adorable team. Kashina proudly grinned. Please take care of my son, Kurama. I know he can be quite the troublemaker. Hey, Kurama chuckled knowingly while ignoring Naruto's indignant cries of denial. I'll make sure to. The nine-tailed chakra beast turned his gaze towards Minato with an expectant stare. Is there anything you'd like to add? The fourth Hokage simply shook his head with a small smile. Be safe you two, the both of you. With their goodbyes finished, Hagoromo had already finished the necessary preparations as a large seal formula appeared beneath Naruto and Kurama while Minato and Kashina took a few steps back. Good luck, Naruto. May you find happiness in your new life. The sage spoke with reverent pride. As the light from the seal gradually enveloped him, 
Naruto looked to his parents one last time to see his father's arm wrapped over his mother's shoulder as they each waved from where they stood. A large ringing sound filled the air to the point that Naruto could no longer hear anything. Although he couldn't use his ears, Naruto's eyes were still able to make out his parents' final words to him. Thank you for allowing us to be your parents, Naruto. In a flash of light Naruto and Kurama were gone. As soon as they disappeared, Minato and Kashina nodded to one another before waving Hagoromo goodbye as they left soon after. Hagoromo wearily sighed to himself after having to witness a rather heavy-hearted reunion. Nevertheless, he spoke out to the empty void around him. As you can see, he's made his decision. Now the question is, what do you intend to do knowing the choice he has made? The only response Hagoromo received was silence. Hey, coming from him, it was a rather common answer. In a forest somewhere in fury, Naruto woke up under a tree in a verdant forest just as a droplet of rain fell onto his nose. His eyes blearily opened themselves to reveal the wilderness that encompassed him. The weather was quite chilly while the rain didn't help in terms of warmth. He assumed that night had already fell but it was hard to tell with the vast sea of storm clouds that hid the sky and rained upon the earth. The shinobi looked down at his clothing and was surprised to see a black cloak with a red outline on the connecting center and edges of the garment. It was highly reminiscent to the formal Akatsuki's uniform minus the red clouds. Underneath the cloak was a new red jacket like the one he had received from Jiraiya on his training trip. His pants and signature sandals remained the same from the ones he previously owned with the only difference being that they were new. Tentatively touching his forehead, Naruto found that he had still kept his former leaf headband. So many thoughts flooded his head at the same time. What would he do now? Just what kind of things awaited him in this new world? Deciding to gather his bearings first, Naruto sat up and leaned his back against a tree. The first thing he needed to do was check his chakra reserves. Closing his eyes in concentration, he felt himself connect to the boundless ocean of chakra that belonged to Kurama and himself. It looked like the fox hadn't fully recovered from the war since his snores were heard loud and clear. Then again, he had no idea what kind of toll interdimensional travel would have on the beast, so he wisely decided let him rest. Ignoring the Kyubi's steadily recovering chakra, he finally found his own pitiably low reserves. It looked like he had fully recovered either after going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the goddess of his old world. Sighing to himself, it looked like he wouldn't be using chakra anytime soon. I wonder where he sent me anyway. Naruto wondered to himself as he sat up. The heavy splats of rain hitting the ground filled the entire forest with nature's peaceful melancholy. His moment of relaxation was cut short by a loud bestial roar that shook the forest in its entirety. Wildlife scattered as they ran away from the source of the roar while an expression of wariness appeared on Naruto's face. Whatever that was, it definitely didn't sound friendly. Without a single moment of hesitation, the shinobi was up on his feet and bolted full speed towards the unknown. Little did he know that his presence would drastically change this new world. For better or worse, Naruto Uzumaki was going to shake the very foundations of Earthland's core. The hero of the fourth great shinobi war leapt from tree to tree much like his previous life in Konoha. If there were any humans nearby, they would only see a barely visible blur of blonde hair flying past them in an instant. Following the source of the tremors while keeping an eye for toppled trees, Naruto found the source. As Naruto arrived to the scene, he saw a giant beast looming over a young girl white-haired girl who looked around his age. He watched as the girl remained stock still, refusing to move out of the monster's warpath. With one arm, she cradled her other which in all likelihood seemed broken. From the distance, Naruto was able to make out two dull eyes that looked all too familiar. They were the eyes of someone who had just lost the will to live. Mirajan Strauss was a teenager with white hair tied in a ponytail with a purple bow and radiant blue eyes similar to his own. She donned a dark, skimpy sleeveless shirt adorned with some light curved motifs on the chest, a short skirt held up by a studded belt with a demonic looking buckle and thigh-high boots with stiletto heels, each bearing a skull adorned by a flower on their upper front. Her appearance didn't really matter at the moment. For the first time in the entirety of her life, Mirajan Strauss, S-class mage of fairy tale, felt numb. The pain that she felt from having the bones in arm broken no longer seemed to matter. The scrapes that decorated her legs didn't sting. 
She could no longer feel the freezing rain that beat down on her or hear the earth-shattering stomps of the beast in front of her as it drew closer and closer. She wondered to herself just how the mission went so wrong. Her brother's body had been taken over by the beast after he had tried to take over the king of beasts. Elfman had been feeling jealous that he couldn't pull off a full-body takeover like his sisters and had resorted to trying to subjugate a monster out of his league. By the time she had realized what had occurred, it was too late. With its revitalized body, the beast broke her arm tearing apart the muscles in it like wet tissue paper. Like the appearance that she prided herself on, her broken arm didn't matter. Lysina Strauss was a short, petite girl and wore a short, dark red dress with a white collar and bow. Up on her arms above her elbows, she wore gold rings with a pale pink fabric flowing down from them. She was bright young girl, a wizard of fairy tale, and above all else, she was Mirajan's dear sister. The youngest Strauss sibling had returned to report her status. She had evacuated the townspeople only to find her sister injured and her brother nowhere to found. She had run to her sister's side and asked where their beloved brother was only to learn the harsh truth. Elfman's envy had led him to a useful body takeover resulting in the total loss of his sanity. Although this would normally cause panic for most, Lysina had turned around and calmly approached the beast. Seeing the small morsel stand in front of it, the beast had regarded the young girl in front of it with a dangerous silence. Lysina get away from there. The words Mirajan had cried reverberated within the confines of her mind, constantly playing on an endless loop. The eldest sibling had tried with all her might to muster the strength to stand, but only succeeded in falling once more. She was forced to watch as Lysina was mercilessly battered away like a fly. She was forced to watch as her gentle frame brutally bounced across the rocky earth before skidding to a stop. Even though she moved her broken body to her sister's side by sheer will, she could only watch as her sister disappeared into nothing within her arms. She no longer possessed the will to move as the loss of her sister crushed her soul beneath its weight. Even as the beast that was her brother loomed over her with its hand raised in a similar fashion, she couldn't care less about her life. She waited for the final blow to come. The blow that would in all likelihood shatter the remaining bones in her body before putting her through an even worse death than her sister. That blow would never come. Get down. Out of nowhere, a blonde teenager who looked to be around her age appeared right in front of Elfman before tackling her to the ground. The beast's hand barely missed the two of them as the resulting force blew apart a set of trees a couple meters away. She felt the stranger pick her up and carry her away after throwing her body over his shoulders while carefully making sure not to aggravate her broken arm. With her current mental state, she never registered just how quickly the man managed to carry her safely to the tree line. He set Mirajan down carefully against the trunk of a tree. Hey, are you okay? Stay with me, where does it hurt? His voice was deep and comforting, but she didn't even bother to meet his gaze. Her dull, Broken eyes remained transfixed on the wet earth. Why did you save me? She quietly murmured. I'm gonna get you to a doctor. Just hold on, Naruto said unable to hear her murmurs. As Naruto made to inspect her hand, he was left shocked as Mirajan slapped away his hand with her good arm while fixing one of the most soul-crushed glares on his person. Why didn't you just let me die? Naruto was left momentarily taken aback by the estranged white-haired girl's outburst before he returned the glare with full force. Because I won't let a defenseless girl with a broken arm get killed because of her own inability to move. This is usually the part where people say thank you. Thank you, Mirajan coldly repeated. Thank you for what? Thank you for saving me from my brother who's lost his mind. Or maybe I should thank you for not being able to save my sister when he killed her. It was unfair. Deep down she knew it was unfair to accuse someone she had never met of being unable to save Lysina, but she didn't care at the moment. She had just lost one of the brightest lights in her life that kept her alive. One of the few remaining buoys that kept her from sinking beneath the harsh weight of reality. Naruto's eyes widened finally putting the pieces together. The reason her eyes were like that. His two cerulean orbs narrowed and returned towards the beast that was currently looking for them uprooting trees and destroying boulders in the process. Making sure Mirajan wasn't in a position to hurt herself, he exited their hiding spot with his face contorted into an expression of solemn rage. Even now the beast hadn't managed to locate them. Well, he was about to find out. Hey, 
The beast's glowing purple eyes found their way onto Naruto. A deafening roar shook the earth as he stepped closer and closer to his newfound prey. Despite having a stature nearly twenty times smaller, there was not a single trace of fear to be found in Naruto's eyes. No, there was only fury. The frigid rain relentlessly poured down on him soaking his hair as dozens of drops ran down his face, but he didn't even notice them due to the inner heat that seethed from his chest. Aren't you supposed to be her brother? He calmly questioned gesturing to Mirajan's visible body. The beast didn't deign to reply as he continued to walk forward with murderous intent radiating off of him in waves. So it looks like you won't ever remember what happened here. Fine then. Although he knew Kurama was recovering, Naruto only hoped the fox would forgive him for borrowing a bit of his chakra. Focusing the flow towards his arm, Naruto channeled the unpurified, raw chakra of the Kyubi around his right arm. A red, bubbling cloak surrounded the limb from the forearm to his fist before the skin steadily began to peel away revealing a black and red coating beneath. At the very moment Elfman threw a fist intending to crush the blonde, Naruto vanished only to reappear over the beast's head. I'll make sure to get a proper explanation from you after this is over. Using all his might, Naruto punched the back of the beast's head. The blow had so much force it nearly broke the sound barrier as it propelled the beast's body straight into the ground burying him nearly ten feet deep. A spider web of cracks emanated from the focal point spreading across the ground. With a single blow, the beast was completely put down as Naruto safely landed behind it. The monster's body glowed before slowly reverting back into a human with bright, white hair and tanned skin. Releasing a breath of air, Naruto willed the chakra around his arm to recede leaving slightly burnt skin that had already begun to repair itself. Walking over to the crater, Naruto grabbed one of Elfman's arms with his good hand before yanking his body out of the ground. The shinobi dragged the unconscious and shirtless teen with him back into the tree line where he found Mirajan who didn't even register his return. The girl's knees were tucked against her chest as she pulled them close with her arms. Naruto set Elfman against a different tree across from her before touching her shoulder to get her attention. As soon as he had touched her shoulder, he immediately pulled away. She was cold, frighteningly so. Taking off his cloak, he wrapped it over Mirajan and sat beside her before pulling her close. She finally acknowledged his presence before weakly attempting to pull away to no avail. Let go of me, she quietly murmured. You're wet and cold. The last thing you need is a fever that you won't be able to fight off with your current state of mind and I'd rather you not die of hypothermia either. Despite expecting her to continue resisting, Naruto was left surprised when he felt the girl relax and stop moving. The shinobi felt a distinct wetness on his chest that wasn't from the rain. It was warm. Looking down, he saw a steady stream of tears flow down Mirajan's cheeks as she cradled herself within her own arms. Listen uh. I couldn't save you, listen uh, I'm so sorry, quote. Mirajan continued to sob into his chest while continuously calling out for listen uh, who Naruto assumed was her late sister. There was nothing else that he could offer her right now. The only thing he could offer was a place to grieve. He would end up sitting there through the rest of the night as Mirajan cried herself to sleep. The next morning, this feeling was quite nostalgic. Naruto had not ridden on a train since his mission in the Land of Snow where he saved Koyuki, the film princess and political daimyo. Unfortunately, there wasn't a single chance that he would be able to enjoy it at the moment. His eyes moved from the rolling landscape to the two sleeping siblings in front of him. After the rain finally stopped, Naruto had recovered enough chakra to create clones that could carry the two sleeping siblings back to town. When a passerby saw him carrying the two back into town, he pointed out to the shinobi that they were both fairy tale guild mages renowned as the takeover trios Mirajan and Elfman Strauss. Mages, from what Naruto could infer, were the replacement for shinobi in this world and Mirajan's team had accepted a job for their guild to eliminate the monster terrorizing the town. Guilds, a congregation of mages that accepted various types of jobs for cash payment. The system was similar to that of the hidden villages but nowhere near as militarized. The whiskered Jinchuriki was able to glean this bit of information from the same passerby after asking what guilds were before receiving a strange stare. After finding the town's city hall, Naruto was able to convince the town's mayor that he was an ally of the Strauss siblings who was going to take them back to their guild for medical attention. Thankfully, 
the location and directions to Magnolia Town's fairy tale came up in the conversation and so the reward money was passed on to him. He didn't intend to rob the two siblings of their money after what they had been through, but he knew he needed a bit of money if he were going to bring them aboard the train. To be honest, he had no idea if either of them would even accept the reward money after what transpired the previous night. These events then led to their current situation. Naruto's thoughts were brought to a halt as Mirajan slowly began to stir. Heavy, black bags beneath her eyes showed just how weary she felt as her vision finally returned. Her clothes were ragged exposing even more of her body than it did before. Naruto could practically hear Jiraiya's tempting him to look down. Good morning, Naruto plainly stated as his gaze returned to the window for various reasons. Like those mountains. Yep those were a nice pair of mountains. Mirajan slowly looked around to study her surroundings. Where? Where are we? She confusedly murmured. We're on a train heading back to Magnolia Town. You two are part of a guild named Fairy Tail, right? At the aforementioned name of her guild, Mirajan's eyes snapped open as she looked around the cabin for her sister, desperately hoping that last night was a nightmare and nothing else. There's no one else here besides us three. Naruto softly spoke. So then, you really did save me last night. Mirajan said choking back a sob. If he was here, then that meant listener really was. I'm sorry. The shinobi gently murmured. Mirajan's eyes slightly widened in confusion. What was he apologizing for? Her expression lit up as the accusations she made the night before popped into her mind. She lowered her head ashamed and humiliated. No, I'm sorry. I I wasn't thinking straight in. I blamed you for my mistakes. The ivory-haired girl wiped the corners of her eyes with her thumb as she settled her gaze on the boy in front of her. He looked to be around her age while she observed his rather distinct traits. His vibrant eyes were cerulean blue and closely matched her own in terms of color. His striking blonde hair was one of the brightest she had seen that could only be compared to the grandson of Makarov Dreyar. Finally letting her curiosity get the better of her. Mirajan decided the anonymity had gone on long enough. Who are you? She warily asked. Seeing that he was the one being addressed, Naruto ceased his sightseeing to focus on his inquisitor. My name's Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki. I asked about you two around town while you guys were asleep. You're Mirajan, right? The girl in question silently nodded. Can you tell me what happened last night? At that very moment, Elfman began to stir as he groaned before opening his eyes. The big man was currently wearing a shirt donated by one of the townspeople to replace his destroyed one as a thank you for defeating the beast. Big sis, what happened? Why are we back on the train? Naruto's expression hardened as his hard gaze stayed fixed on Elfman who had yet to notice him. As Elfman looked around for one particular person, he finally asked the question about the one person Naruto wanted to learn about. Big sis, where's Lissana? Mirajan winced hearing her sister's name. Her hands balled themselves into tight fists as they rested on her lap. She lowered her gaze onto her hands as she tried to keep her voice together. Lissana, Mirajan swallowed hard. Lissana is dead, Elfman. There was nothing but silence. Elfman's expression said it all. Spread across his face was the reflection of utter disbelief and growing desperation. Hey, sis that's not funny. Where's Lissana? Come on, she's hiding around somewhere isn't she? Elfman, Mirajan began. She held onto her broken arm that had been wrapped in a makeshift sling. It most likely came from Naruto she surmised. The S-class mage bit the corner of her lip, trying to say with all her might the words that wouldn't come. You killed Lissana. You lost control of the full body takeover and you killed her. Elfman's lips slowly quivered while the corners of his eyes watered. No. You're lying, that can't be true. Not seeing Mirajan deny his claims, Elfman's heart sunk. His large shaky arms slowly rose to hold his head as the tears began to fall. No, I couldn't have. All I wanted was to use a full takeover like you too. I didn't mean for this to happen, he choked. It didn't even last a second. Elfman suddenly found himself being hoisted up by the collar of his shirt as Naruto slammed his back against the cabin's walls. Naruto. Wait, are you kidding me? The shinobi lowly muttered. W who are you? Elfman asked with wide eyes finally noticing Naruto's presence. You endangered the lives of your sisters and killed one, but for what? Out of jealousy. 
From despair to fury, Elfman's eyes changed as a burning rage flared brightly in his eyes. Who the hell are you to mention my sisters? Naruto, please stop. Mirajan jumped out of her seat and tried to remove Naruto's arm from Elfman but it was to no avail. The shinobi's arm was not going to be moving any time soon. The eldest sister knew what he was going to say, but she couldn't stop him. If there was one thing she wanted to do as an older sister, it was to at least spare her last sibling the pain of knowing how close he almost came to the point of no return. Who am I? Naruto repeated incredulously ignoring Mirajan's cries for him to stop. Pulling Elfman's shirt before slamming him back into the wall, Naruto's voice rose even louder than the two siblings combined. I'm the one who stopped you from killing Mirajan too. She would have been dead if I didn't get there when I did. Like a wisp in a hurricane, the inferno in Elfman's eyes was doused and extinguished in an instant, leaving only behind an expression of despair. Little by little, his gaze finally fell on his oldest sister who looked away. I, I almost killed you too. Mira gingerly nodded as her eyes started to tear up once more. Naruto released his hold on Elfman causing him to fall to the ground. The large mage collapsed to his knees cradling his head within his hands. Slowly and progressively, the large man began to sob uncontrollably. His frame shook with grief while his cries of anguish filled the cabin. Mirajan could only watch remorsefully as the image her brother had tried to build fell to pieces. Looking on, she watched as Naruto's face softened as he sat back down to watch the window. His face no longer reflecting anger, but self-deprecation. Magnolia Town, Fairy Tale Guildhall. Not a single word was spoken for the remainder of the trip. As they traversed the streets, the beat-up bodies of Mirajan and Elfman drew the stares of many Magnolia residents. For those who knew them more closely, the silent question as to where their youngest sibling remained kept to themselves. After being urged to regain his bearings at the soothing words of his sister, Elfman had finally managed to climb back to his feet, and with heavy heart, carry himself back to the guild. Mirajan had done her best to compose herself, but whether she would be able to hold it while reporting the incident was a different story. For all the terrible experiences that he had gone through, the loss of a sibling was something that Naruto could never understand. The closest thing he ever had to a brother was his bond with Sasuke. Yet like the Uchiha said he had no idea what it was like to lose something that he never had. The unjustified fate of Itachi Uchiha had driven Sasuke to the very brink of self-destruction as he killed hundreds on his quest for revenge. The fact that Mirajan and Elfman could hold themselves together after losing their precious little sister was something that Naruto couldn't even imagine as he walked with them. He inwardly chuckled wondering just how his supposed second chance at life could have possibly gotten off to a rockier start. Shaking his mind away from those thoughts, Naruto instead chose to focus on studying the architecture of Magnolia. From the quaint bakeries and shops to the Grand Cathedral, everything seemed to be closely located next to each other. Looking around, he could see that there were a variety of different citizens ranging from a young couple, to a small family, a group of kids, or even an elderly couple. There was one thing they all had in common despite their numerous differences. They were all happy. The realization that this town was truly a home for them dawned on Naruto. They had begun walking towards the fairy tale guild hall and Naruto quietly enjoyed the sights and sounds of this new world by himself. The streets of Magnolia were made of cobblestone while a built-in canal was in the middle of the street. Lanterns could be seen every couple meters while Naruto could only marvel at the sheer complexity of their homes compared to the ones back in the elemental nations. As the guild hall came into view, Naruto noted that it was somewhat simple. The building was a two-story wooden building with a pagoda roof and had a sign above the door that said, Fairy Tale. The name was pretty clever in Naruto's opinion. The Strauss siblings moved ahead of Naruto and opened the door. Naruto had been expecting many things, but total pandemonium was not one of them. The entire guild hall was engaged in an all-out brawl that destroyed nearby tables and chairs and knocked out mages left and right. The inside of the guild was just as quaint as the outside minus said war zone. The floors of the guild were made of long wood boards which was currently covered in splinters and debris from shattered furniture and tableware. As soon as they entered, it was as if a switch had been turned and the entire fight had came to a close. Every fairy tale mage looked to the door at the new arrivals and suddenly stopped all raucous activity. 
They noticed the condition of the two elder siblings and immediately moved towards the group with looks of concern and worry. What the heck happened on your mission? Are you guys okay? Where's Lysina? I'll kick your ass if you're the one who did this new guy. The group was bombarded with questions until a powerful voice decided to make itself known. Enough. Makarov Dreyar, third master of fairy tale stepped forward with worry in his eyes after seeing his children's condition. He moved towards the Strauss siblings as the crowd parted to let the master through. The elderly man carried a wooden staff with him that rhythmically tapped the ground with each step he took. Elfman was covered in bandages while Mirajan had a broken arm. Needless to say, the old man was significantly worried for his children's condition and could only speculate on what happened during their job. Makarov was a short man who had a nearly bald head, but retained hair surrounding the edges of his skull. He wore a simple white t-shirt that was covered by an orange hoodie that surprisingly fit his small stature and a matching pair of orange pants. Are you two okay? He worriedly asked. Where is Lysina? Yeah we're fine master, but can we talk about this somewhere else? Mirajan forcefully requested. The ivory-haired teen didn't like all the looks of worry she and Elfman were receiving and desired to talk about this in a more private setting. There was a lot to discuss, more so concerning Lysina's whereabouts. Of course we can go to my office. The old man immediately replied ushering the other members away to create a path. As the trio followed the master to a nearby office door, all eyes returned to the blonde who had arrived with the two siblings. They stared and then blinked. Naruto stared back. A few seconds passed before Naruto decided it would probably be best to rejoin his newest acquaintances considering the fact that nearly everyone was currently staring at him with a, who the hell are you? Expression. Master's office. The three mages and shinobi made themselves comfortable in the confines of Makarov's office. Elfman decided to sit down, while Mirajan and Naruto opted to stand. The latter which was curiously looking around at the various decorations of the room. Makarov's attention was brought towards the newcomer as he turned to look at the unfamiliar figure in the room. The boy held a curious gleam in his eyes as he observed the various common magical items Makarov's office contained. His spiky head of blonde hair seemed like a brighter shade compared to his grandson yet his attitude was the polar opposite. Noticing the master's gaze on him, Naruto gave him a polite wave. Makarov chuckled at that, now who are you, young man? I saw you enter with my children, but we haven't been formally introduced. My name is Makarov Dreyar, he said as he held his hand out for a handshake. The blonde shinobi was temporarily taken back by Guild Master's sudden introduction before he met the master's grip with one of his own. Since he had made a respectful introduction, it was only fair he returned the courtesy. Naruto Uzumaki, at your service. Naruto respectfully replied giving a cheesy one-handed salute. Makarov chuckled while Mirajan slightly smiled at the blonde's presentation. Makarov's head turned to the takeover duo as he decided to quickly address the matter at hand. Two of them looked heavily injured while the third was missing. Now what on earth happened on that mission? The guild master asked with an expression of deep worry. I know this was an S-class job, but it shouldn't have posed much difficulty for someone like you, Mira. Where is Lysina? The pair shifted underneath the master's gaze, neither one wanting to report what happened. Eventually Mirajan decided as the eldest sibling it was her responsibility to tell the details of what had happened on their mission. She took a deep breath and composed herself. Stealing her resolve, she forced herself to continue on. When we encountered the beast, I sent Lysina back to warn the village about the monster. It was a bit tough, but me and Elfman managed to defeat it. It took about half my magic to defeat it, and I should have been paying more attention but I was too late. As we were heading back, Elfman tried to take over the beast. She spoke. Elfman lowered his head down in shame as he clenched his teeth in regret and self-loathing. He knew it wasn't intentional. He knew that she was only stating the truth, but the truth hurt. The truth was that he killed his little sister all for the sake of his foolish pride. He had no right to call himself a man. If anything he was nothing but a jealous child considering his beyond stupid reasoning for acting as he did. At first he seemed to have retained control, but the beasts will overpowered him. He caught me off guard and broke my arm and by the time I had run out of magic Lysina returned. Mirajan continued. The eldest Strauss had a frown marring her features as she bit her lip. The memories of what had happened were still fresh on her mind, 
and she didn't wish to think about it unless she wanted to have a breakdown in front of everyone. Mirajan's arm cradled her broken one as its grip tightened. She tried to reason with Elfman, but she, she paused to take a breath. She ended up getting fatally wounded. Mirajan managed to finish. Mirajan could no longer retain her composure as she collapsed to her knees. Her quiet sobs caused her body to rack itself in grief as Makarov was left stunned. Elfman grit his teeth and clenched his eyes shut as a few tears escaped. Makarov seemed to age considerably as his facial features contorted into one of solemn heartache. The giant of fairy tales fist clenched themselves so tightly that his desk began to crack beneath the weight of his power. The loss of a building or two was irrelevant, but the loss of a child was something that Makarov would normally never allow to happen. A parent should never have to outlive his own children. As much as the elderly wizard wanted to immediately leave the room and destroy the nearest forest, he still needed to have one thing answered. I found Mirajan and Elfman by luck. Naruto suddenly said earning Makarov's attention. I managed to save Mirajan before Elfman could hurt her too and I knocked him out. The tight vice grip Makarov's hand was locked and slowly loosened as Makarov wearily sighed. I see, then I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Naruto. Makarov's expression spoke volumes of his feelings as Naruto was stunned by the sheer gratitude he could feel from the elderly man. His onyx eyes held the most respect he hadn't seen in ages directed solely at him. You have my thanks for protecting my children. One of them may be lost but we will forever honor her memory. For saving her two siblings, you have my eternal gratitude. How nostalgic. It had been a long time since he had heard words like those, but he didn't deserve it. Naruto smiled apologetically in response to Makarov's thanks, as I already told Mirajan, I'm sorry that I couldn't have made it there quicker. Naruto said with the same sincerity. Mirajan who was physically being supported by her brother bit her lip in guilt once more as she looked downwards. The duo moved to the door to leave. Their parts were done, and there was no longer a reason to stay. As Elfman helped Mira regain her balance, he opened the door to follow her out. The door closed behind them with an audible click. Naruto was left alone in the room with the master whose eyebrow rose slightly. If I'm being honest, I'm a bit lost on what to do right now. Naruto spoke as he scratched the back of his head. I'm not really from around here and don't really know where to go. Makarov was surprised by the new information that had come to light. Seeing as how he was practically indebted to the blonde, Makarov decided he would help him to the best of his abilities. A sudden thought crossed his mind and with it came an opportunity. The man in front of him seemed rather strong for his age. Headstrong, straightforward, and direct, yet his compassion was one of the purest he had encountered in years. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you young man? Hum, I just turned 17 recently. Why do you ask? Powerful, yet so young. Makarov murmured to himself remembering that the new kid was able to completely knock out an S-class beast. If you like, you're welcome to join my guild, Fairy Tail. Fairy Tail, Naruto curiously repeated, that's the name of this guild isn't it? Why's this guild named Fairy Tail? A small smile that seemed to grow with each passing second appeared on Makarov's face as he heard the shinobi's question. The third guild master still remembered the day he had asked the same thing to his predecessor, Precht Gabold. Speaking in a voice that could only be matched by priest of Zentopia, Makarov began to recount the significance behind his prized guild's name. Do fairies really have tales? Do they even exist? Like them, this place is an eternal mystery, a never-ending adventure. These were the words passed down by the first master which were then passed to him. He had engraved them onto his heart to remember for the rest of his life during his youth. Fairy tale is a family for those that desire one. Everyone here has a past that haunts them, but here they will never be alone. There will be times when we've lost all hope and no longer have the strength to stand. Makarov paused offering a kind, grandfatherly smile to Mirajan and Elfman through the window. But together, we will continue to move forward. We will continue to push through the hard times and face everything the world throws at us with a smile. Eternal adventure, huh? Naruto couldn't help but feel awe-inspired by the wizened man's words. A guild created to be a family that would move forward together supporting each other. Although the circumstances were different, Naruto had wished for nothing else but a family as a child. Maybe he could find his purpose here.
I guess you've got a new recruit right here then. Naruto slightly smiled. Welcome to Fairy Tale, Makarov congratulated. The man's expression fell once more as he clasped his hands together behind his back. He moved from behind his desk to stand by one of the windows in his office as he looked over his children. If it's all right, I'd like to postpone your official induction and briefing. I'd like to inform the rest of the Guild of Our Loss and schedule a funeral. Naruto's grin fell as a sad smile took its place. Of course, his eyes moved to the window where he saw the two Strauss siblings get swarmed once more. The rest of the guild would learn the truth soon it would seem. Makarov bowed his head in thanks before moving to open one of his desk's drawers. The old man withdrew a strange wooden object before presenting it to Naruto. Where would you like your stamp, Naruto? The guild master asked. Stamp, the shinobi eloquently replied, although now isn't the time to introduce you, I'd still like to give you your stamp. This stamp will identify you as a member of Fairy Tail. You can choose the color and where you want to put it. Makarov explained, it's essentially a painless tattoo. Naruto's eyes lit up in understanding as he nodded before undoing his black cloak. He rolled up the sleeve of his red jacket revealing his arm. I'd like to have it on my right arm in black if that's all right. The old man placed the stamp between his shoulder and elbow and lifted it up. Naruto tilted his arm to get a good view of his new marking before he nodded in satisfaction. It looks great, thank you. Makarov chuckled and nodded. He got up from his seat and made his way to the door before opening it. He looked behind him offering an apologetic smile. I'm sorry that we couldn't have had you join under better circumstances. Trust me, it's really no big deal. If you need any manpower for the service, I'll help you out to the best of my abilities. Naruto smiled learning against the nearby wall. Thank you, I am truly grateful. Makarov left Naruto to address the rest of the guild leaving the Jinchuriki to stir in his own thoughts. Downstairs, Naruto could already hear the cries of disbelief and the sobbing of others. None of these people were related by blood excluding the Strauss siblings, yet their reactions were that of actual family members. I fall asleep for about a day and your emotions are already in turmoil. If this place is causing you trouble, then just leave. Kurama plainly suggested. It's the opposite. Kurama. Fairy tale. They really care about one another like a family, I think I'll like it here. Naruto inwardly replied with a chuckle. The fairy tale mages were quieter than church mice in the wake of the Strauss siblings' somber return. It had started like any other ordinary day. They drank, they laughed, they fought, it was the home they all came to know and love as fairy tale. Until Mirajan and Elfman both returned short of one member. One of their strongest S-class mage's arms were broken while her brother looked like he had seen much better days. The current state of their returning members had entirely overshadowed the arrival of the newcomer following behind them. No one had ever seen Mirajan look the way she did. Her harsh, inspiring confidence was nowhere in sight while her tomboyish personality had all but crumbled to pieces. All that remained was the husk of a once bright girl. The way she carried herself resembled a prisoner taking his final march to the executioner's scaffold, broken and resigned to their end. Elfman on the other hand had lost any semblance of machismo and gallantry he once prided himself on. If anything, it appeared as if he had reverted back into his more timid and fragile personality from when he was a child. Every stare sent visible shivers through his hulking physique while the only thing his gaze could focus on were the floorboards of the guild. Lastly, there was the absence of their third team member, adored sister, and friend to everyone. Listen a Strauss, the most kind and compassionate individual, was nowhere in sight. Many of the wizards assured one another that she probably went straight home or that she may have missed the train back to Magnolia. However, there existed one person who feared the worst had occurred. A loud crash sounded out across the hushed and murmuring hall. The attention of the wizards were drawn to a single table that had been split in half. The two pieces fell to opposite sides with a loud clatter while splinters decorated the floor like confetti. The cause was a young knight named Urza who sported a dark expression of silent rage. The audible squeaking of her metal gauntlets from being clenched so tightly could be heard by everyone as she got up from her seat and headed to the door. The dull thumps of her footsteps continued to resound through the soundless building until they finally left through the door fading from hearing and memory. To others she may have appeared angry, but that anger was directed elsewhere. 
she had seen the same look on Mirajan's face countless times before. After all, it was the same look she had every day when she first came to the guild. It was a crumbling mask that she had put on every morning when she woke up after arriving in Fairy Tail. It was a colorless and deteriorating item she would spend countless hours on trying to patch its holes so that no one would be able to see the scared 11-year-old girl beneath it. After bearing its weight for nearly eight years, Urza recognized a mask better than anyone else. E. Urza, Natsu hesitantly called out the name of the person he both feared and respected but it was to no avail. No one stopped her as she stormed out of the guildhall just as no one noticed the lone stream of tears that fell from her left eye. Natsu glanced towards Grey, another boy who looked to be the same age with raven hair. Grey's current attire consisted of, well, nothing really. The youth was only wearing a pair of boxers at the moment. Grey, what's wrong with Urza? Grey's eyes lingered on the door for a short while longer as he sighed in response. I don't know Natsu, there's something she's not telling us. Natsu. The dragon slayer of fire looked downwards on his lap where his best friend Happy wore an expression of worry. The feline's constant grins and cheerful demeanors were practically his trademark, but they just weren't there today. Natsu smiled and rubbed Happy's head the way Lissana taught him to when the Exceed felt depressed. What's up, buddy? Where's Lissana? She didn't come back with the others. Natsu's reassuring smile cracked. She was fine, and he was most likely overthinking things. She's probably at home waiting for us to get there. He answered with a grin. His thousand watt smile was practically contagious as it managed to significantly raise Happy's spirit. I, at that moment the door to the master's office opened. Everyone's gazes immediately shifted towards the room's exit where the Strauss siblings both walked out before descending down the stairwell to the main floor. If it were even possible, Mirajan appeared in an even worse state than before. Her eyes were bloodshot from what looked to be hours of crying while her expression was absolutely disconsolate. Oblivious to her current state, Natsu decided to speak to her despite the others silently urging him not to. Grey had noticed as well and reached a hand out to Natsu but he was too late. Hey Mira, how'd the job go? Did Lissana just go home? We all promised to go fishing together. Happy chirped. Elfman stepped forward and placed a large hand on Natsu's shoulder confusing the dragon slayer. Elfman, Natsu was the last person the guilt-ridden giant wanted to speak to at the moment as a large lump formed in his throat. Natsu I'm sorry, Lissana is, she's, Lissana's dead, Natsu. Whatever chatter and whispers remained died with those three words alone. The youngest generation of wizards stared at Mirajan's collected, unmoving visage that had answered Natsu. The snow-haired girl's sapphire eyes were a murky blue that looked like they belonged on a dead fish instead of a human. Her calm demeanor was an obvious lie revealed by the quivering of her lips as she bit down on them. The veteran wizards said nothing else as they lowered their heads in grief. The kids had yet to learn just how dangerous their occupation was, but to lose someone like Lissana. It was gut-wrenching, it was like a painful knot being hatefully twisted around inside of them. They would never be able to comprehend how Natsu felt. As soon as the words were spoken, Grey had practically bolted from his chair into Natsu's side but he was too late. What did you just say? Everyone stood paralyzed as Natsu's tone was the coldest anyone had ever heard him speak. His fists balled themselves so tightly that his nails turned white from the pressure while exposing a bulging vein on the side of his temple. As he took a sharp breath of air, the surrounding wizards could have sworn they saw embers come from his mouth. Happy's reaction was even worse. The blue cat looked catatonic as if his small heart was being ripped out of his chest. No. You're lying. Small tears emerged from the corners of his eyes before slowly rolling down his cheeks. Listen is not dead. She's not. Natsu went straight for Mirajan. Seeing this, Grey quickly took action and used his two arms to grab Natsu from behind and hold him back. You were supposed to protect her. You said that you could handle the quest without me. Let go of me, Grey. Natsu's screams of outrage tore through the hall while Grey struggled to keep his hold on Natsu. Mirajan's frame trembled with each shout and accusation directed towards her. Her strength to stand here continued to corrode as she could practically feel her composure crumble apart. Happy sat on the barren floor of the guild oblivious to his surroundings. 
The winged cat repeatedly murmured to himself that it couldn't possibly be true and that Lysina was still alive. His heartbroken ramblings was almost a chant as he tried to cast a spell to change the reality before him. He wasn't trying to convince Mira and Elfman that they were mistaken. If anything he was trying to convince himself. That's enough, Natsu. Standing by the second floor's banister, Makarov Dreyar had watched on with a stern gaze before jumping down from the upper railing to the ground floor. The old mage had seen enough and would take on his child's fury himself if necessary. Besides her siblings, Natsu had been the closest person to listen to since they were kids. Makarov had watched the two grow up together for years and it pained his aged heart to see Natsu like this. If Natsu bottled up these feelings they would only hurt someone else, or worse, the boy himself. Watching the scene unfold from above, Naruto shook his head from side to side, his expression one of bitter understanding and regret. It was painfully apparent that Lysina had existed as a bright sun in the lives of many of these good people just as Naruto's parents had been in his. Casting a scanning gaze over the crowd below, Naruto opted to study the rest of Fairy Tail's members. In the far back corner, he found a group of three close to his age comprised one of girl and two boys. The blue-haired girl was silently crying to herself while being comforted by her teammates. His keen eyes picked out a particular girl near the counter. She had long, flowing chestnut hair, brown capri pants, and a bikini top on as her preferred style of dress. He safely assumed that she was quite the drinker for her age judging by the large barrels of what he could only assume contained alcohol set next to her. However, she was as sober as can be. Her expression was one of anguish as the intensity of the negative emotions he felt from her was greater than the others. Before she left, Naruto had also noticed the scarlet-haired mage leave the guildhall with feelings equally as intense as the brunette. However, there were only two who really stuck out. That pink-haired brat's releasing a lot of negative emotions right now, Naruto. Shouldn't you step in? Natsu was his name. The shinobi had heard his name murmured numerous times since his arrival and he wouldn't be forgetting it anytime soon. His eyes darted towards Mirajan, the second source. The amount of pain, heartbreak, and guilt she gave off only continued to grow and he could practically feel how close she was to breaking. Yeah, I know, I, it wasn't her fault. Before Naruto could respond, a loud shout momentarily overpowered Natsu's multiple ones. Naruto and a few others winced at the sheer volume of the masculine voice that belonged to to know one other than Elfman. Everyone's eyes fell on the gentle giant who looked more fragile than glass, a single flick being all it would take to shatter him. The son of Igniel's shouts of anger were halted by the beast soul mage, a shamefaced and penitent expression marking his self-deprecating countenance. Please, Natsu, I, the gentle giant rasped, I'm the one you should be blaming not Mira. I tried to use takeover on the beast and lost control. I'm the one who killed Lysina. What happened next was a blur to everyone close by, yet for those involved it happened all too slowly. A harsh elbow logged itself into Gray's side, knocking all the air out of his chest like a deflated balloon as his hold on Natsu loosened. Makarov had been prepared to accept Natsu's blows in order to quell the raging storm in the boy's heart yet even he didn't anticipate the amount of strength that had bubbled to the surface as he was shoved aside into a table knocking it over with a clattering bang. The dragon slayer was already upon Elfman in the next second with a fiery fist raised and a blaze burning in his eyes as an agonized roar of hurt and sadness bellowed from his gut. Makarov's eyes widened as he had already used his giant magic to enlarge his hand and reach forwards in an attempt to block Natsu's attack. However, it was far from enough. There was not a single chance that he would make it in time to shield Elfman. Out of the corner of his eyes, he could have sworn he saw a blur of black and red whiz past his field of view, appearing from above and moving in a direct line towards Natsu. From Natsu's perspective, it was like having an out-of-body experience. He knew it was his body, but as soon as he heard Elfman speak it was like his arms moved on its own. His legs propelled him forward with absolute ferocity running through them. Gasoline pumped through his veins like blood fueling the burning fire in his chest. His fist was only mere inches away from hitting Elfman while his ears blocked out the cries of everyone yelling for him to stop. Expecting to hit and potentially break Elfman's jaw, his fist would never reach its target. A loud crack echoed across the hall, a sound created through the clash of two humans. Now in between Natsu and Elfman, 
Naruto had the fire mage's burning right hand firmly captured within his left before completely snuffing out the flames. His black, red-lined cloak slowly fluttered back down due to its inability to keep up with the speed its owner moved with. The shinobi's calm stare was neither angry nor irritated, but was instead sympathetic. As Makarov landed on the main floor, he stared on in shock at the fact that Naruto's speed had managed to beat him there by miles. He knew for a fact that the blonde jumped after he did but to witness a display of speed that even he as guild master could not see. It was unimaginable. As Natsu tried to push Naruto out of the way, the shinobi didn't bother giving an inch and spoke up. If you want someone to take your anger out on, then you can take it out on me. Who the hell are you? Natsu spoke with eyes narrowed in suspicion. My name's Naruto Uzumaki. I saved Mirajin but I wasn't fast enough to save her sister. If I showed up sooner, I could have saved her too. The Jinchuriki calmly released his grip on Natsu who had come to his senses. A smaller fire still burned in his eyes as he stood resolute against the whiskered blonde. Move, this is between me and him. You should be more careful. Naruto spoke ignoring the younger boy's demand. You almost hurt your friend with that stunt. Before Natsu could question him, he followed Naruto's gaze before his eyes widened. With the edge of a table burrowed into his back while leaving a colorful bruise, Gray was hunched over a sleeping happy as he silently pushed the table off of him and gingerly moved the feline into his cradled arms. When Natsu had shoved Makarov aside, the ice wizard had dove in to protect the cat from the pushed over table caused by the master's fall. The edge of the table left a heavy indent in the place where Gray had dropped it as he walked back over to Natsu, an unreadable expression marking his features. The ice wizard did not need to speak to pass his message to Natsu. If he'd been just a tiny bit slower, Natsu may have lost more than just Lysina. Fortunately Happy was already unconscious due to the massive shock he received making it easier for Gray to swiftly save him. Natsu's facial features slowly turned pale while his entire body started to tremble, the realization of just how close he was to losing someone else sinking in. Gray slowly approached the trembling dragon slayer before carefully giving Happy back to Natsu, the exceeds peaceful snores soothing his partner's nerves. Wordlessly, Natsu rigidly turned around before leaving the guild. Everyone's eyes followed his departing back until he finally exited through the doors. As if nothing happened, Naruto turned around and walked towards Mirajin while ignoring them, the countless wary gazes being directed towards his back. She hadn't even noticed Natsu almost attacking Elfman. Her eyes were shadowed by her hair while her quivering had yet to cease. Each step he took drew him closer until he finally stood directly in front of her. Elfman's sideways gaze were focused solely on him just like the others but he paid them no mind. The shinobi placed a hand on her shoulder before lowering his mouth to the side of her ear. Your sister must have been a wonderful person to be cared for by everyone here, he gently whispered. Her shivering calmed for only a brief moment but the Jinchuriki could tell she had heard. Straightening up, he noticed by her expression that she was back in reality. Her tear-stained complexion still remained as torn as it had been but she looked better. His resolute cerulean eyes were locked with her sapphire orbs, silently telling her that it would be okay. He offered one last smile before turning to leave. On his way out, he stopped by the taciturn yet observant Gray and held his hand outwardly. The ice make mage was still holding the area bruised by the table after it was knocked over. Noticing Naruto's hand, he met its owner's gaze before nodding with a thin smile. Thanks, um. In the heat of it all, no one else besides Makarov would ever think about just how fast he had moved to save Happy and block Natsu at the same time. With no more distractions, Naruto left out of respect for a family that had just lost a dear member. The East Forest Sitting against a sturdy tree, Naruto rolled up the sleeve of his red jacket beneath his cloak. Channeling his chakra towards the limb, a seal appeared on his wrist. He placed two fingers on the marking and, almost instantaneously, two scrolls burst into existence in a cloud of smoke. Naruto blinked confusedly remembering only receiving one from his father. The one from his father had been a simple green scroll that he could have found from nearly any ninja tool supply shop in Konoha. The mysterious second one was pure white with black rods on each end. Unfurling the second one, Naruto was greeted with a message. Dear Naruto, if you are reading this then that means you have safely arrived to Earthland. 
I am glad that I was able to be of use. This is. This writing belongs to the old man. Naruto could hear the surprise evident in even Kurama's voice as he continued to read the letter. Although only a short while has passed since we said our goodbyes, I wanted to impart a few words to you, so please indulge this old fool. When I look at you Uzumaki Naruto, I see a child who has become the man he is today without the presence of family. Watching you reunite with your parents for one last time brought a nostalgic warmth that I hadn't felt in ages. Your father has passed on his knowledge while your mother has passed on her love. I believe that it is only suitable to present you with a farewell gift as well. Looking towards the bottom left corner of the parchment, Naruto noticed a seal that could be released. Placing his thumb on the mark, a new object appeared in a puff of smoke. As he held the delicate object in his hand, Naruto couldn't stop the warm smile that spread across his features. The Sage of Six Paths' final gift was a picture in a frame. It was a picture of his family. Minato and Kashina were smiling brightly to the camera dressed in their civilian attire while holding an infant him together in their arms. The picture looked like it had been taken near Konoha's river beneath the shade of a tree. His mother was wearing a light green sundress while his father wore a white short-sleeved shirt and a pair of long blue pants. It was beautiful, almost like a portrait that had been painted as a photograph. When it comes to giving gifts, the old man's in a league of his own. Kurama chuckled in reminiscence. Yeah, he really is. Naruto laughed. As Naruto held the sage's gift within his hands, he heard the loud cracking sound of a tree collapsing in the distance. An audible crash boomed throughout the forest while the squawks of birds flying away accompanied it. Carefully making sure to return the picture and scroll to the seal on his wrist, Naruto climbed up to his feet before patting himself down. Kurama, can you tell what was that? It's nothing hostile if that's what you're wondering. The tailed beast yawned. I'm going to go back to sleep. If you need help, don't ask me. You've been sleeping a lot lately. Naruto idly noted while running through the forest. Why wouldn't I? I finally have a living space that's not flooded with water and in a metal sewer. Oh, I see wait what? What do you mean by that? Kurama made an audible. Ah, sound as if realizing he had forgotten something important. Since the seal's no longer there to hold me back, I can alter the area I live in as much as I want. You should see what I've done with the dumpster that you used to have. Just, just go to sleep, damn you. With the inner conversation serving as a distraction from boredom, the shinobi arrived to his destination in mere moments. As he emerged from the forest line, he was greeted to the sight of the same crimson-haired swordswoman from before cleaving through what looked like her fourth tree in a single swing. The blade met hardly any resistance judging by how the top of the trunk cleanly slid off revealing a perfect cut. Hey, uh, can I please ask you to stop butchering those trees? You're scaring off the, well, everything. Although he wasn't exactly the best, he was still a shinobi that excelled in moving very, very, lightly. He could tell that the mage hadn't even heard him walk up to her exposed back if what happened next wasn't already an indicator. Startled by the unfamiliar voice, Urza whirled around directing the tip of her blade to the stranger's throat in one fluid motion. She hadn't even heard or sense him arrive until he spoke. Her hazel brown eyes met ocean blue that reflected neither fear or worry. Um, hi. Urza's eyes lit up in recognition as she remembered where she had seen him from before. He was the stranger that had arrived with Mirajan and Elfman. Her eyes widened even further as she watched Naruto roll up the sleeve of his jacket to reveal a black fairy tale guild stamp. It didn't even take her longer than a second to withdraw her sword. Naruto Uzumaki, I'm a new member, nice to meet you. Urza Scarlet, was her simple reply. And I apologize for almost hurting you. Naruto waved off her apology with a reassuring smile. It's fine, I'm used to it. Urza gave a strange look and said nothing else as Naruto decided to observe his surroundings in closer detail. She internally sighed as the feeling in her chest hadn't subsided. Her expression reflected the turmoil in her heart that she had hoped to quell by releasing her frustrations through venting. Looking down, she checked to see that her sword was still in good condition before moving on to the next batch of trees. So I guess that's a no. Urza glanced behind her to see that Naruto's attention was focused back on her his expression unyielding along with his request. Pardon. 
I asked you to stop chopping down some trees, but you look like you don't plan on listening. Do you think you can stop me? She questioned through narrowed eyes. This man's head was held up far too high if he was underestimating her this much. I don't see why not. After all unlike those trees, I'll actually put up a fight. Within seconds, two new broadswords materialized in a golden light and flew into the grip of their owner. I am not in a pleasant mood, so the responsibility of what happens next lies solely with you. Kicking off the ground, Urza launched towards Naruto twisting her body in midair to slash twice, once with each blade. The Jinchuriki leapt backwards creating a large divide between them while his hand reflexively moved towards his tool pouch. His eyes suddenly widened upon realizing he didn't have a ninja tool pouch anymore. Oh, shit, his hands frantically searched through his pockets, sleeves, and nearly any other spot that he could think of in search for a weapon, but it was to no avail. Urza had already noticed this and took full advantage. The knight continued her charge towards the shinobi reaching him in a matter of seconds with both blades raised. Ha, the two broadswords moved towards him without any sign of stopping. Thinking quick, the Jinchuriki moved his palm from the side in order to hit and redirect the tip of the blade away from his person but what happened instead shocked both of them. As soon as his palm made contact with the side of the blade, his thrust completely destroyed Urza's weapons into fragments. The Scarlet Warrior's eyes widened as she watched the bits and pieces of her weapons scatter into the air. Without a moment's hesitation, she jumped back to gain some distance away. Her eyes focused on the new recruit intently, scanning over him in search for any signs of magical enhancement or hidden weapons. If anything, the fact that he looked like he had no idea what happened either only served to annoy her even more. The shinobi's grin widened much to her chagrin as he finally noticed something. Looking down into his own palm, Naruto saw it. A pointed blade resembling the tip of a kunai protruded from the palm of his hand while the base of it was still hidden inside his palm. I wonder, closing his eyes, he visualized both the kunai's blade and handle before slowly withdrawing it out of his body. Feeling something tangible in his left hand, he opened his eyes to see a slightly glowing, golden kunai now in his hand. It was without a doubt the pointed end of her mother's adamantine chakra chains without the links at the end. Seriously, does this mean I can create an endless amount of kunai? Deciding to put his theory to the test, Naruto repeated the process of visualizing another ninja tool feeling the same pull from before. He watched as a second kunai materialized in his other hand before he retracted it back into his body. Oh that is so freaking cool. Giving the first kunai a couple of test swings, his contagious smile reflected his satisfaction with its overall quality. Now that I have a weapon, come at me whenever. Urza glared at the easy-going blonde, her body already gathering the magic necessary for what followed after. Don't be so arrogant, requip. Naruto's eyes blinked in surprise while his mouth had an, whoa, shape. Urza was finally giving him a display of, magic, first hand. Her body was enveloped in a heavenly, light that clung to her form like a second skin. Ripples in the air formed around her hands before in a flash of light it was over. Heaven's wheel armor. She confidently spoke. Counting a total of fifteen swords, Naruto ventured to guess that this new armor provided a lot more benefits in terms of numbers when compared to her previous one. Readjusting the grip on his dagger into a reverse grip hold, he fearlessly charged forward towards his opponent's trump card. Go. Urza pointed the sword in her right hand towards Naruto, and as if they possessed a mind of their own, the floating swords behind her all pointed their tips at him before soaring towards him at breakneck speeds. Let's see if I've still got it. Calling on his chakra, he felt the energy rush through his veins like a river towards his hands before they enveloped the chakra chain dagger like a sheath. Like Asuma said, grind the two sides together in order to create a fine point. Slowly but surely, the wind chakra coating his kunai gained form as a glowing, ethereal blue blade that extended to the size of a short sword. With one hand, Naruto swung the blade with both precision and timing as he cut through the swords like butter as soon as they reached him. One by one, each of the fifteen blades were cut down into pieces as he grew closer and closer to Urza's position. Materializing more swords behind her, Urza rushed towards her opponent who had to quickly evade in order to match the different timings of intercepting a blade and Urza at the same time. The moment he jumped allowed him to cut down the sword first before blocking Urza's twin slash. 
The strength the knight had put into her attack launched Naruto backwards into the forest with Urza moving quickly in pursuit. As they moved through the trees at a breakneck pace, she watched in surprise as Naruto maneuvered through the forest with the dexterity of a monkey. It was clear that he didn't possess the ability to fly like she did, but his alternative was rather, odd. By timing his jumps, Naruto would leap from branch to branch while simultaneously performing flips in order to dodge an oncoming blade or slash it down while he was still airborne. Damn it, I won't be able to hit him at this rate. Let's see you get through this. Summoned by a golden light, 30 blades materialized behind Urza, ready to command by her and her alone. Using her telekinesis, she manipulated the wing-shaped broadswords to rotate at blinding speeds. It didn't take long until none of the individual swords could be discerned from the large bladed ring. Circle sword, she sent the whirling wheel of blades that was nearly 15 feet in diameter towards its designated enemy. A confident smile graced her attractive features as a sense of victory grasped at her fingertips. There's no way to dodge as they will only chase after you, Uzumaki. It's my win. Expecting the new member stop and raise his arms in surrender, her predictions were blown out of the water. Refusing to budge a single inch, Naruto performed one final jump that took him out of the forest and onto Magnolia's river bank. The clean river behind him glimmered with the sun's light slightly blinding Urza's vision but she would clearly see what happened next. Turning to face the storm of swords, he held out his blade of blue energy to the side while an amused grin spread across his lips. Sorry Urza, but there's one thing you should probably know. His tone was nonchalant and calm, as if there weren't thirty sharpened swords aiming to slice him all at once. Even if you brought out one thousand, none of these dull swords could ever beat the sharpest knife. Switching into a reverse grip with the extended point facing downwards, Naruto literally vanished from his spot. From her position, Urza's eyes were locked on the departing back of her circle sword formation. The very next moment Naruto disappeared, the ring of swords exploded into a whirlwind of shards and scraps of metal that were blown away by gusts of wind. It's my win. Her eyes widened as they slowly looked downwards finally noticing the buzzing blade held at her throat. She hadn't even noticed Naruto's presence right next to her until he spoke. It wouldn't even take a second for him to kill her if he wanted. I concede. She said swallowing her pride. And just like that, he was back to normal. The blue. Humming knife at her throat vanished into particles of light while a hearty smack on the back of her armor caused her to cutely yelp in surprise. Urza quickly covered her mouth while an embarrassed heat burned in her cheeks. She turned to glare at the blonde who didn't even notice her as he was currently stretching. Well, that was fun. Feeling better now, Urza blinked once. Wait, did you, did you challenge me just to satisfy your boredom? She asked in disbelief. Naruto apologetically smiled while chuckling. No, that wasn't my reason entirely. I was actually hoping for a chance to ask you a couple things. Urza blankly stared at Naruto, silently contemplating whether or not she should be angry that he had utterly defeated her out of a sense of boredom or compliant to his request. She suddenly realized something. He beat her. He had beat an S-class mage like it was an everyday chore. Forgive me for asking but where exactly did you come from again? Naruto tilted his head in confusion at the rather abrupt change of subject. Uh, I was walking through a forest when I found Mira. No, I meant your previous affiliation. Do not take this the wrong way, but I'm one of the strongest members of Fairy Tail, yet you defeated me without suffering a scratch. This begs the question as to who and where you originally worked for. Urza explained with a slight glare. Ah, shit. This question was bound to come up eventually but at the moment even he didn't have an answer. I guess you could call me something of a freelance mercenary. Naruto nervously chuckled. Mercenary. Urza stared incredulously. You mean to tell me that you've never joined a guild until now of all times? More or less, I would usually just complete requests here and there. He shrugged. Urza could only stare dumbfounded at the blonde. She had no idea whether to be flattered that he had joined Fairy Tail alone or shocked at the fact that he was practically the same age having only joined Fairy Tail. Pinching the bridge of her nose, she closed her eyes and accepted his answers with a sigh. I believe you had questions. Would you tell me about Lysina? Urza's eyes snapped open prepared to berate him for his rude prying only to suddenly stop. 
It wasn't childlike curiosity or an insensitive desire of personal information that drove the question. His hopeful eyes only sought understanding. Her gaze softened understanding his position. Lysina had a strong presence in the lives of everyone and it was only natural that he wished to understand just how much. Urza moved to sit down on the grassy hillside by the river. She pulled her legs towards her chest. If she wasn't obligated to give a serious response, she would have chuckled at the irony that she was sitting in the exact same place that she used to go to every day when she felt like crying after she joined. She didn't feel like crying for herself this time. Lysina was a kind soul. Urza smiled in sad reminiscence. Following her example, Naruto sat next to Urza on the grassy hill silently listening. She didn't like fighting among ourselves and often took it upon herself to soothe ruffled feathers and preserve the peace. She loved everyone and took care of us like a mother even though she was the youngest out of all of us. She slightly chuckled, and this happened quite often with Natsu the most. She paid him the most attention always making sure he was on his best behavior and respectful towards others. Were they close? Urza's gentle gaze watched the steady river as it continued to flow through Magnolia at a mellow pace. She sometimes envied nature's simple habits, always moving forward without ever stopping. She was Natsu's first friend and Happy's mother. Naruto frowned, his eyes shadowed by his hair as Urza continued to recall past memories while memories of his own resurfaced. It seems like it was so long ago when they first found Happy's egg and raised him in a small home they built. I see. Urza turned to give Naruto an inquisitive stare, the shinobi remembering that she had departed early. After you left, Natsu almost attacked Elfman after learning that he was the one who accidentally killed her. Urza's expression mirrored her utter disbelief and doubt. Elfman did it. Is he okay? Physically, yes. I managed to stop Natsu and send him away. Emotionally, Naruto paused, remembering the state of the older brother before he left. I really don't know. An uncomfortable silence fell. Urza couldn't possibly imagine how Elfman felt, knowing that he had to live with the fact that he killed his sister. How did you know? Urza's was brought out of her inner turmoil by Naruto's sudden question. How did you know what happened to Lysina even though you weren't there? Urza's eyes reflected a heart-pained sadness. The reason that she knew was the same reason that she was in the forest in the first place. Mira and I are rivals. We know each other sometimes even better than we know ourselves. When, when she first came into the guild, I could tell immediately that something was wrong. Her magic was just so, weak. Naruto's cerulean orbs gradually widened. What do you mean by that? It's exactly like I said. I couldn't even feel the magic that she used to have and with Lysina missing, it wasn't difficult to figure out. Urza downheartedly answered, even from here I can only feel a dying spark instead of the fire it used to be. Mira will no longer be a mage. The reason for Urza's distress finally dawned upon the shinobi. She wasn't just mourning for the loss of a family member. She was also mourning the loss of a rival. The Scarlet Mage probably couldn't find a way to help her friend and rival which is why she had decided to take it out on the forest. Naruto gazed at the white clouds as they rolled along the clear sky, one cloud in particular resembling the head of a young boy. What if it were him? If Sasuke had decided to quit being a shinobi instead of pursue revenge, what would have changed? Would he have come to stand where he is today if he wasn't chasing after him? would have grown stronger without the shadow that he desperately tried to escape from. No, I won't let her. W what? Urza stuttered, gaze flickering over towards Naruto while wholly believing that she had misheard him. I don't know what it's like to have a brother or a sister, but if it were me I wouldn't let Mirajan run away and give up. Urza stared wide-eyed in disbelief, the boy before her seemed different in contrast to his less than serious attitude from before. And Naruto. What are you talking about? What do you intend to do? Although she could feel her own worries and doubts claw at the edges of her mind, Urza's plague thoughts were soothed by the genuine smile spread across Naruto's features as he chuckled warmly. I'm going to be a friend. Any problems with that? Urza intended to rebuke him, arguing that Mira would not let anyone get close to her in the state she was in now, yet the night stopped herself. Urza had spent years under the oppression of monsters, and experienced the wickedness humans were capable of firsthand at a very young age. As a result, Urza had sharpened that sense during her growth in magic, and was often able to distinguish the true nature of others. 
She could tell when someone was hiding their depravity beneath a false face, no matter how well it was constructed. It was due to this sixth sense of hers that she felt that she could trust Fairy Tale's newest addition. There was something different about the way he carried himself compared to the others around their age, but there was no denying that she could only feel sincere honesty emanating from his words. Maybe, just maybe, he could help Mira through this ordeal. No, none at all, Urza sighed with a thankful smile. Even if she tries to lock me out, I'll keep trying so count on it. Naruto chuckled. Urza stared incredulously at the whiskered teen's face. The fact that someone this interesting could fly under the radar for years astounded her to no end. She lightly chuckled once more before standing to her feet and dusting off her skirt. For a mercenary, I must say that you are rather strange. The shinobi returned the smile in full with a confident grin of his own. To be honest, I was never really good at my job. Hours later somewhere deep in the east forest, the sun still clung to the afternoon sky but it was slowly starting to descend. The clearing in the forest was tranquil and quiet except for the consistent sound of metal scraping rock. Sitting cross-legged in front of a small hut made of straw and sticks, a boy with pink hair held a knife using it to carve and engrave the tombstone. Next to the boy, a blue cat quietly slept using his leg as a pillow. After he had left the guildhall, Natsu had ventured up into the Magnolia's forest carrying Happy along with him until he finally reached his, no there, home. On his way up, he gathered a fairy large rock and picked up a knife from his home. Using his magic, he cut the rock cleanly before setting out to work. Carved onto the rock were the words, Listen a Strauss, best friend and beloved mother. Above the script, the insignia of fairy tale had been meticulously engraved to create a magnificent image. Carefully moving Happy to avoid disturbing him, Natsu softly smiled watching his partner's sleeping face. Although he would deny Lisina's presumptions that he was Happy's father, he would never say that the three of them weren't a family. Setting the stone into a pre-dug hole, Natsu Dragneel refilled the crevices to hold the stone in place before standing up. It was an uncharacteristically beautiful aesthetic work of art for someone like him, but if it was for her he would do anything. His onyx eyes looked tired, as if he hadn't slept in ages. The pain in his chest hadn't gone away yet and neither had his anger. Angry at who he didn't know. Mirajan for bringing in Lysana on that mission or Elfman for foolishly denying his help. He often wondered what his life would have been like if Lysana hadn't come into his life. That day he came home carrying what he believed was a dragon egg at the time, was also the very same day he met Lysana Strauss. Back then he didn't have the first clue on how to raise an egg, yet Lysana was the only one who readily volunteered herself to help. They built the hut behind him as their first home. It wouldn't fit either of them now, but it was still their first home together and its memories wouldn't die with Lysina. Every day whether it be rainy or sunny they would carry Happy's egg and set him down in the freshly collected straw. They would wrap him in layers of blankets making sure he was warm before deciding to read stories. Lysina would be the one to read while Natsu listened along with the egg. He still vividly remembered his favorite story that Lysina read. Long ago, a kingdom's king and queen sought to marry off their daughter into a foreign land in order to gain more power. The princess chose to reject her fate and had run away from her castle. She crossed over rivers and traversed through forests for two days and two nights with barely any provisions. As she collapsed due to hunger and weakness, she arrived at death's door awaiting his cold embrace. That is until she was saved by a wandering dragon on the outskirts of her land. The dragon found her unconscious and carried her back to his den where nourished her back to health and took care of her. When the princess awakened, she was greeted with the sight of a massive, crimson dragon. Rather than scream in fright, her hazel eyes met the dragon's red ones and asked, Are you the one who saved me? The dragon replied, I am. Do you not fear me? The princess smiled and shook her head. A dragon that saves a human isn't evil. For years the dragon had wandered through hundreds of lands. In each one he had saved a human life, man, woman, or even child. And nearly every time he had been met with fear or betrayal. Nevertheless he refused to give up his search for proof, proof that humans and dragons could coexist. Even if I were to crack open your skull, would you not fear me then? The princess shook her head once more. Even if I were to die, my soul would not rest until it has repaid your kindness. 
For the first time in decades, the dragon stared at the young woman perplexed. What is your name? My name is. The book that Lysina read was aged and had parts that were worn and torn away, but the ending remained intact. After the dragon and the princess's faithful meeting, they flew away and created a prosperous kingdom of their own that would stand for centuries. Perhaps it was a bit childish of him, but Natsu had always put himself in the role of the dragon and Lysina in the role of the princess. She was the first and only one who ever truly reached out to him despite his less than desirable behavior. They came from completely different worlds, but together they created many things. They had fun playing around and going on adventures despite being the other's only company. It's a very beautiful stone, Natsu. I'm sure Lysina would have been grateful. Natsu didn't even bother to turn around. He had already known who it was due to his keen sense of smell. Glancing over his shoulder, his hollow onyx eyes met Oceanic Cerulean. The same Oceanic Cerulean that he had met for the first time a couple hours ago. Naruto emerged from the forest and continued to walk forward until he stood side by side with Natsu. His gaze fell on the handmade tombstone with both respect and piety. How did you find me? Natsu despondently asked, eyes still focused on Lysina's grave. I have my ways. Naruto shrugged, I asked around and I figured you'd be here. It wasn't the total truth but it wasn't a total lie either. Kurama's ability to sense negative emotions helped greatly. The two stood in silence listening to the chirping birds in the background along with the occasional breeze of wind that swept through the trees. Do you hate me? Naruto suddenly asked. Natsu was quiet, his body refusing to move from its current spot. No, was his hushed answer. Naruto carefully observed Natsu from the corners of his eyes, gauging his reactions. Do you hate Mirajan? No, he wasn't lying so far. Naruto sighed before asking one third and final time. Do you hate Elfman? As Natsu gazed upon the grave that would serve as Lysina's resting place, he could only see her smiling and gentle face. His fists clenched themselves tightly while a tight lump formed in his throat. The corners of his eyes stung while he could feel his voice starting to choke up. No, I don't. The Jinchuriki softly smiled as he pulled out a bouquet of flowers before laying them down in front of Lysina's grave. The flowers were diverse in color. Just like how Lysina's presence brought color into everyone's lives. Do you know what it feels like? Having someone close to you die? Naruto glanced towards Natsu who had asked the question. The dragon slayer's eyes had finally begun to show an emotion other than anger as tears started to cascade down his cheeks. The passionate inferno that raged in his heart had died into weak embers and ash. He closed his eyes shut and choked back his sobs, forcing himself to remain standing. Naruto's gaze softened as he looked at the grave in remembrance. The image of the grave he made for Jiraiya rising to the surface. After his teacher had passed away, he felt nothing but hollowness and anger that would have consumed him if not for the people around him. He would never get the chance to make Neji's grave. I do. Natsu collapsed to his knees and punched his fist into the ground, his sobs visibly causing his body to tremble in grief and sorrow. It's not fair. It never is. Does the pain ever go away? Naruto wryly smiled. He stuck his hands into his pockets before shifting his gaze onto the orange sky. It was a breathtaking sight that reminded him of the people that lived on through death in his past. The third Hokage, Zabuza and Haku, Jiraiya, Neji, and his parents. No, it doesn't. Naruto crouched down and placed a hand on Natsu's shoulder, his eyes drifting towards Lysina's name. That's why it's so important that you never forget them. Remember who you've lost. Naruto spoke, his eyes drifting to happy. Remember what you still have, and lastly. He ruffled Natsu's head, prompting him to meet his strong gaze. Remember their hopes and dreams so that you can become strong enough to protect all of them. Become so strong that you'll never have to lose someone you love again. Even if they aren't with us anymore, they'll live on in our hearts, so keep living for them. Natsu looked downwards one last time before regaining the strength to stand up. He wiped his eyes dry and sniffled. I'll do it then, he quietly murmured. The son of Igneal scooped happy into his arms before turning to face Naruto, his expression one of determination and fortitude. I'll get strong enough to protect everyone at fairy tale. Naruto chuckled and smiled. I'll be right next to you when you do. For now, please go back to the guild. They'll want you there for her funeral. 
Natsu nodded, slightly shifting happy in his arms before deciding to ask his question. Are you coming too? Even if you just joined, you're a member of our family now. The blonde lightly laughed in a reassuring manner. Don't worry about me, I'm just going to stay with Lisana for a bit. He waved goodbye until Natsu was no longer in sight. He turned to face the grave once more before sitting down cross-legged. A comfortable air of silence and tranquility formed around him as he admired Natsu's handcrafted work. I really wish I got to meet you, Lisana. You have a wonderful family here. The shinobi spoke with a melancholy smile. They're a rather quirky and interesting bunch. They like to fight, they can be pretty crazy, but I can see why you love them so much. Most people would consider him crazy for talking to graves, but to Naruto it was like having a conversation with a real person. Even if they couldn't speak to him, he would treat them like they could. You won't have anything to worry about, Lisana. I'll watch over them for you and I'll make sure to not let Mirajin give up from this. That's an Uzumaki promise. Naruto stood up and dusted off his pants. He gave one's last glance to the grave before vanishing in a swirl of leaves. In less than a week, the hero of the leaf, winner of the fourth great shinobi war, descendant of the sage of six paths, and the Jinchuriki of the nine tails found himself attached to a group of people with hearts nearly matching his own in size. Two days passed since Naruto joined Fairy Tail, but the air today was far more somber. Gathered in the Cardia Cathedral's graveyard, the entirety of Fairy Tail's wizards came together in mourning. Lined up in rows, the wizards had all worn black for the occasion in order to pay their respects to both the deceased and her siblings. The skies were darkened with murky, gray clouds that overwhelmed the clear sky in its entirety while silent doldrums settled around the cemetery, killing off all traces of the wind. As if the sky was mourning the loss of one of its most beloved inhabitants, the rain trickled down the headstone-like tear accompanied by the millions of raindrops that were shed onto the earth below, completing the visage of sorrow. A cold, biting air surrounded the loved ones gathered as they looked on at the epitaph. Here lies Lysena Strauss, beloved sister and friend to Animal Souls X768X782. The stone wasn't extravagant or gaudy, no if anything it was perfect. Its design was a simple marble surface, yet it held an imperceptible elegance. It was a magnificent final tribute to Lysena's memory. The service lasted two hours but no one would have cared if it lasted all day. Some had brought umbrellas expecting rain and used them while others couldn't find it in themselves to give a damn about getting wet. Naruto stood towards the back of the group holding an umbrella of its own. The black color matched well with the black suit, tie, and dress pants that he wore over a white undershirt. He was rather grateful that the mages in Fairy Tale were generous considering his only set of clothes consisted of what he had when he arrived. Gray had loaned him the suit stating that it was one of the nicer spares that he always kept. Looking around, the blonde observed and carefully studied each guest. One of the groups that he hadn't seen before stood near the back along with him. The unmistakable leader of the four had striking yellow hair like his own, but that was the only similarity. A lightning bolt shaped scar went over his right eye while his body's stature was much bulkier in comparison to the shinobis. Judging by the way they carried themselves, the two men and woman behind him were his teammates or followers. One had long, distinctive green hair and his looks alone gave him an appearance only gifted to that of nobility. If the Jinchuriki had to describe the second male, he would have to describe him as, unique. The dark, blue-haired mage had a stick figure tattoo going over his face while his hair had been slicked back for the occasion. The third members, the woman, most distinctive features included the glasses that sat on the bridge of her nose while her tan-colored hair was tied outwardly to the side. Just like the rest of the group, the leader was dressed in a black suit, white undershirt, and black tie. Even if they gave off the feeling that they weren't very close to the rest of their guild, their feelings of regret and sympathy were genuine. Deciding to ignore the group, his eyes refocused on the others close by. Natsu stood towards the front of the group along with Urza and Grey. Natsu's disposition emitted a taciturn strength as he held a weeping happy in his arms. His honest and straightforward eyes never left Lysena's name even as he tried to soothe his friend. Although his heart greatly ached, the shinobi took solace in the fact that the infamous pair would undoubtedly move past this. A small smile crossed his lips seeing Urza comfort the boy in a sisterly manner while Grey did the same. 
Standing closest to Lysena's memorial, Mirajan and Elfman grieved over the loss of their sister while Makarov remained close by choosing to stand behind the two. The area around the old man's eyes were red indicating that he had mourned recently as well. Despite possessing a stature only a few inches taller than a toad, Makarov's atmosphere radiated with both unwavering resolve and unbreakable pride. You're regressing. Naruto's smile turned into one of melancholy regret as his gaze shifted towards the drops of water that fell from the tip of his umbrella's edges. The voice within his mind belonging to his nine-tailed companion. A little bit, he inwardly replied to his partner, watching as a lone raindrop fell to the ground. The Jinchuriki was never a fan of funerals. He remembered the first one being Serutobi Hiruzen's which was later followed by his son Asuma's. Jiraiya came not long after but he was thankful it ended there. A word like depressing couldn't possibly ever hope to describe the atmosphere of funerals. The pain, the misery, the regret, the blame, the never-ending chain of thoughts like, I could have prevented this, were always parts of the process. The blonde could hear Karama's aged sigh from the inner confines of his mind. You can't expect yourself to live up to everyone's expectations even if those expectations haven't even been developed. The fox settled into a more comfortable position, using his arms as a makeshift pillow to rest his chin upon. He closed his heavy eyelids while he yawned tiredly. Whenever you meet new people, you always end up sacrificing your own happiness and well-being to protect theirs. A lone crimson eye opened, reflecting centuries of experience. You're doing the same thing as last time. You should be more concerned about yourself. At Karama's words, a wry grin etched itself onto his well-defined features. Gaze scanning over the friends that he had made so far. If I ever get to that point, I know I'll be able to rely on these people to bring me back. Karama's gravely chuckles reached the shinobi's ears. Still a stubborn brat as always. The conversation between the strongest remnants of chakra ended with the sound of wet footsteps exiting the cemetery. The shinobi's ocean blue eyes drifted towards the exit where an older man with slicked back blue hair while carrying a sleeping boy around the age of four in his arms started to leave. You leaving already, Macau? Macau? Naruto would make sure to remember the man's name. Yeah, I don't want Romeo to catch a cold in this weather, Wakaba. The shinobi continued to note that the man with a pompadour was Wakaba who had nodded before moving to hold his umbrella over the father and son. Slowly but surely, more fairy tale mages began to file out. One by one, two by two, they all left soundlessly, leaving the siblings that had lost a piece of themselves to lament over their sister. Naruto wordlessly watched until Natsu, Urza, and Grey were the last ones to leave, leaving behind Makarov, himself, and the Strauss siblings. Makarov turned away from Mira and Elfman and silently made his way towards Naruto, who had remained towards the back for the duration of the service. The wizened mage stood next to the shinobi, head hung low and eyes closed in thought. So you're a former mercenary, I hear. The blonde's eyebrow quirked itself upwards in curiosity at the sudden inquiry. Urza told you, more or less, but that's not really what I wished to ask you. Makarov evenly answered, were you serious? Seeing Naruto's expression of slight confusion, the third master decided to elaborate. Were you serious about your decision to help Mira? Ah. So that's what this was about. Naruto gave Makarov a reassuring smile as well. I never go back on my word. For a brief moment, Makarov saw the image of countless people standing behind the newcomer. Numerous amounts of men, women, and kids of all ages smiling just as brightly as he, expressing their unyielding support as if to demonstrate his mettle. The old wizard tiredly smiled in resignation before continuing to walk forward towards the exit of the cemetery. Then, I'll leave her in your hands. Over towards Lysena's grave, Elfman stood next to his older sister who was kneeling on the wet, cobblestone. His typically tall and proud disposition was now hunched slightly forward as if his spine couldn't find the strength to uphold the rest of his body. After getting a check up from the guild's reclusive doctor, Perlizuka, his head was wrapped in a bandage with a remedy that would soothe the aching in his head. Mira, we should head back. Not yet. Her voice was so soft that Elfman had barely heard it over the sound of the rain. Her left arm was now elevated by a proper cast prepared by Perliuzika. Knowing that her injury was also a result of his actions twisted a hard knot in his gut. 
Elfman quietly nodded in acquiescence, knowing that she wanted a few moments to herself. The second sibling turned around at the sound of footsteps that nearly blended itself with the light thrums of rain. His dreary countenance reflected surprise upon meeting the owner. Naruto. The shinobi nodded, a sympathetic tone present in his ocean blue orbs. They drifted over towards the snow-haired teen that had kept to herself. Don't worry, I'll make sure she gets home safely. Elfman followed his gaze. A part of him wished to reject his offer, believing that he had already done more than enough for someone they had just met. That part of him was immediately quelled upon seeing the sheer sincerity glimmering in the most vivid cerulean pair of orbs he had ever seen. He wordlessly nodded and started to walk past the blonde before he was suddenly stopped. Elfman. He looked over his shoulder, meeting the newcomer's small smile. Natsu made Lisina a grave by their first home. I'm sure he'd be happy if you went to see her there too. Elfman bit the bottom of his lip, eyes stinging with a warm and moist feeling as he held on to his composure like it was a lifeline. Yeah, I'll make sure too. He strainedly rasped, his fists clenched tightly in an effort to keep himself from breaking down. The gentle giant soundlessly left as the only sounds he made came from his shoes squishing against the wet cobble. As he watched the beast mages departing back, Naruto turned around to see the rain endlessly pour itself down upon Mirajin. The girl didn't even bother putting on the hood of her black coat. From Mirajin's position on the ground, she had thought Elfman had already left after she had requested him to do so leaving her as the last one in the cemetery. The mage had remained completely oblivious to the proceedings behind her due to having her attention focused on the last remnant of her sister. She didn't expect another umbrella to move cover and shield her from the rain. I'm going to take you back home, okay? Her eyes slightly widened upon realizing the voice didn't belong to her brother. For the first time since the service, she lifted her head to look behind her, seeing the last person she ever expected to see. Nar. Dot Yuto. Is that you? Initially believing herself to be hallucinating, the blonde's comforting smile and hand on her shoulder was firm proof that he wouldn't be leaving any her anytime soon. I'm really here, I'm going to take you home, okay. Regaining her senses, Mirajan fervently shook her head and lowered her gaze. And no, not yet, I'm going to stay for a little longer. Naruto sighed good-naturedly and clasped onto her shoulder earning her attention. If I let you stay, you'd be here all night. Your clothes are wet and you're only going to get yourself sick, you know. Mirajan was going to deny Naruto's request but stopped after finally noticing his disposition. He wasn't asking her, no he was pleading her. His ocean blue orbs were laced with concern and worry while the corners of his lips shook slightly showing just how much he was trying to maintain a reassuring smile. She downcastedly lowered her head, accepting the hand that pulled her back to her feet. She felt herself stumble as soon as she stood up a sign that her legs had gone numb after kneeling in front of her sister's grave for hours. Before she could fall to the ground, she was quickly caught by a pair of sturdy arms that held her close. It's okay, I've got you, she couldn't meet his gaze yet felt Naruto's left arm wrap itself around her waist while he allowed her right arm to be wrapped over his neck. His left arm that went around her waist was careful not to put any pressure on her fractured arm and held her securely while his right hand held the umbrella firm making sure to keep her as dry as possible. Holding on to young woman, Naruto started to walk forward alongside Mirajan. The way she moved resembled that of a puppet, without a mind or a soul. Her body moved on its own as if being guided by invisible strings attached to her hands and legs. The shinobi matched each step he took with one that Mirajan took as her mind had automatically began to retrace her usual route home. The pair moved past the cemetery gates, surrounded by the melancholy and silent world of rain around them. The quiet sounds of their footsteps pressing against the wet pathway were the only sounds as they moved past the empty shopping districts and street markets. There was not a single soul in sight besides the two fairy tale members. Naruto's cerulean eyes eventually looked down to see that Myra's gaze wasn't even focused on the path in front of her. Rather, they had been directed towards the right. Following her line of sight, Naruto's crescent blue orbs drifted towards Magnolia's famous canal system as he watched millions of raindrops create ripples in the water. Some ripples were large while others were small. Others constantly impacted the same spot while others periodically altered their course. The water continuously melded its appearance to various shapes and forms, 
yet it didn't change the fact that it was a mesmerizing spectacle to behold. The two stayed like this for the rest of the way. Mirage and Hu's legs would move on their own after having walked the same way home for years while Naruto followed each of her moves without a single misstep. The calm, tranquil atmosphere that encompassed the pair like an intangible blanket had brought a warm air of comfort for Mirajin that she had not experienced for what felt like months. Her heavy-hearted eyes that carried so much heartbreak managed to tear itself away from the river before refocusing on the man next to her. Even as he managed to guide her while simultaneously matching her stride, the steady grip he had around her waist and hand did not waver in the slightest. His eyes that seemed like the brightest blue that she had ever seen seemed, unreadable. She couldn't garner any hints or clues as to what he could possibly be thinking about. Her thoughts came to an end upon noticing that she now stood in front of her home. Naruto had stopped walking as well after following Mirajin's line of sight that fell onto a specific home. Can you stand on your own? Mirajin mutely nodded as Naruto slowly released her from his hold. If it were any other day, she would have grinned in amusement when the blonde's hands hesitantly let her go as if they were afraid she'd crumple without them, and both were already prepared to catch her should she fall. As she walked towards the front steps of her home, she was accompanied each step of the way by the whiskered teen who continued to hold the umbrella over her alone, not paying any mind to the growing wet spots on his shoulders. Mirajan twisted the knob on her door and opened it. She turned to meet Naruto's watchful gaze, his eyes never once leaving her observant stare. She found it rather strange. The yellow-haired, blue-eyed youth that she had only met a few days ago somehow had a unique presence as if he had always been here, right beside her to keep her safe. His kind, honest personality was something that she had never quite seen before as it was different from the kinds that both Makarov and Natsu possessed. From Naruto's perspective, his eyes scanned over each nearly imperceptible motion that Mirajan made. From the slight shivering of Myra's hands that he had tried his best to soothe when he held her to the almost mechanical gait that she walked with, Naruto's eyes studied her carefully, cerulean eyes fixated on discerning her well-being. Despite how heartbroken she appeared, she possessed an unmentioned air of grace. Her resplendent, clear skin and magnificent snow-colored hair seemed to glimmer with the radiance of a white flower in its dreary, gray surroundings. He would be lying if he said she didn't look breathtaking. For the first time that day, Mira smiled. It wasn't one that could be considered sizable or noticeable, but it was there. As small as it was, it spoke volumes of her appreciation. Thank you, if it were anyone else, they may have not heard a tiny murmur of thanks that was akin to that of a whisper in the wind. The shinobi waved his hand in a disregarding manner with a smile of his own. It really wasn't much, but just please get some rest. He watched as the young woman gave one last glance before disappearing behind the door that slowly creaked shut. The shinobi stood in front of the door for a few seconds longer before turning around on his heel to head back to his temporary place of residence. Guess I'll see ya tomorrow. The next day, Monday morning's first rays of sunlight pierced through the pale, translucent curtains adorning the windows of Mirajan's room. The dark, mahogany floorboards were illuminated in various places like a spotlight on a stage by the sun's rays while sounds of its occupants' soft breathing drifted out around the room. Mirajan blearily opened her eyes, sitting up while yawning into the back of her hand. Her hands fell onto the smooth sheets of her bed which acted as a second layer over her white nightgown as her eyes wandered around her room. Her eyes didn't linger long on the pictures of her siblings lined up on her desk in frames and instead chose to clearly see just how lonely her room was. Part of her believed that the funeral yesterday was just a bad dream but the heaviness in her muscles and the feeling that came after crying denied that possibility. Lysina was really gone, shaking her head while trying to avoid thinking about things that would only hurt, she tried to shift her attention elsewhere. Outside her window, she could hear the early birds chirp as they flew past along with the chatter of the few pedestrians who had jobs to go to before noon. Tap, Mirajan blinked at the strange and abrupt sound. There was a pause and just as she intended to chalk it up as a figment of her imagination, she heard the same noise yet again. Tap. Her sapphire blue eyes wandered over towards the source, her window. This time, she was able to see a third pebble bounce off the pane of her window. Swinging her legs over the side of her bed, Mirajan walked towards her window and pushed aside the curtain to allowing enough room for a small peek. Looking down, 
she was greeted to the sight of Fairy Tale's newest addition standing outside her home with a bright smile holding a large sign that said, Help Needed. Urgent. Her face was expressionless as Mira sighed and released the curtain before climbing back into bed. She pulled the covers back over while turning her head away from the window. Tap. Her eyes wearily opened as she grabbed her pillow and stuffed her head beneath it hoping to block out the sound. Maybe if she didn't answer, he'd believe she was still asleep. Tap tap. Needless to say, it didn't work. A look of annoyance crossed her countenance as Mirajan climbed out of bed and peeked through the curtains once more. Her scowl grew more noticeable upon noticing that the Uzumaki had apparently prepared another message on the other side of the sign. I saw you peek through the window, you know, it read. Mirajan unlatched the locks on her window before pushing the two open. The blonde's grin grew after successfully drawing out Mira as he seemed all too cheerful at this time of day. Good morning. The eldest Strauss felt the slight chill of the morning and held onto the upper sections of her arms with her hands. She felt less pain when kept silent as it kept her emotions bottled up inside. Is there something you need? Her voice was quiet and hoarse, but if Naruto noticed then he didn't really care. The shinobi blinked at the fact that he did not receive a good morning in return before shrugging it off. He could easily tell that she was annoyed but as far as he was concerned it was better than being depressed. He flipped the sign around so that the first message was visible once more. As you can see, I'd like your help. He sheepishly chuckled. I'm sorry, but isn't there anyone else you can ask? I'm not feeling very well today. The old man's pretty busy. Natsu and Happy took a job early this morning, and the same goes for Urza and Grey. Naruto replied counting off each person with his hand. Mirajan sighed once more knowing that the whiskered newcomer had a valid reason for coming here, but she still was going to decline. I'm sorry Naruto, but I'm not in the mood so please leave. Yeah, I don't think I can take no for an answer. Naruto nervously grinned scratching the back of his head. It's kinda important. The snow-haired beauty's eye twitched slightly. Dark bags beneath her eyes practically held the top of her eyelid to the bottom while she still couldn't find it in herself to go outside. The buildings and corners that she would see would only remind her of the daily trek to the guildhall that she and her siblings always took together. I'm sorry, but the answer's still going to be no. She apologetically smiled. Naruto's own grin faltered slightly seeing just how pained her smile was, but he wasn't going to give up either. At Mirajan's declination, the blonde mischief maker simply held up a sizable pile of pebbles, wearing an innocent smile the entire time. People call me persuasive, Mirajan never wanted to be able to mute her surroundings more than she did now. Her hair and face were a mess, and put bluntly, she felt like complete crap. She considered trying to ignore the shinobi's attempts at disturbing her sleep and solitude before deciding it would just be easier to help him and go home. She simply closed her windows shut effectively blocking out the slightly estranged blonde from sight. Naruto stared at the closed window silently contemplating whether to start chucking pebbles again or to wait patiently. Deciding on the latter, the shinobi sat on the edge of the pathway with his feet hanging over the town's canal while he simultaneously dumped his stack of pebbles into the water. He waited for roughly five minutes when he heard the sound of a door opening behind him. Turning around, he saw that Mira had changed out of her white sleeping gown into a plain t-shirt and a pair of sweats. Her left arm was still being held within a cast slung over her shoulder while her hair, like the day before, had been left to hang freely with strands falling past her temples and covering her forehead. Looking down at his own clothing comprised of a red flak jacket and a pair of black nylon pants, he noticed that he looked out of place in comparison to Earthland's standards for fashion. Huh. Note to self. Remind me to buy some clothes when I have money. Ignoring his audible mental note, Mirajan directed her hollow stare towards the blonde. To the Jinchuriki, her eyes resembled that of a dead fish, lifeless, empty, and devoid of emotion. His fist subconsciously tightened but the takeover mage didn't notice. What did you need my help for? Ah, right, Naruto began digging through his jacket and pants pockets in search of something. His expression lit up when he pulled out a crumpled piece of paper that he handed to her. With a raised brow, Mirajan uncrumpled the paper reading its contents aloud. Plans for space-time jutsu. Need to find a secluded area first so I don't blow up the entire toe. Okay. Wrong piece of paper. 
That one's on me. Naruto suddenly spoke up snatching the paper out of her grip while she confusedly stared at the team. She was promptly handed a new piece of paper that was practically identical in terms of material and pigment. Items needed from the market. Tomatoes, carrots, potatoes, fresh chicken, onions, freshly prepared chicken. Mirajan's eyes wandered further and further down the list looking for anything out of the ordinary before she directed an unimpressed stare towards the unperturbed shinobi. This is a grocery list. MMHMM. And you came to me completely unannounced, holding a sign that said, Urgent. Help. Because you needed help shopping for groceries. The newcomer's nonchalant nod didn't help his disposition in the slightest. Yep, the place where I'm staying at needed me to go buy some food and I didn't want to be a freeloader, so here I am. A sudden realization hit Mirajan after hearing Naruto's brief explanation. Where was the blonde even staying? As far as she knew, he didn't have any family or friends in Magnolia. She shook her head clearing her thoughts. It's not like she cared or that it mattered really. I know a couple of places we can go to close by. Mira started to walk towards the edge of the street before Naruto suddenly called out to her. Hey, Mirajan. She glanced over her shoulder to see the blue-eyed boy that was lagging slightly behind. His finger scratched the side of his cheek, his persona appearing slightly bashful. Thanks. You really helped me out here. Although she had only known him for a little over three days, there was something about Naruto's character that stuck out to Mirajan. The Uzumaki passed himself off as someone with strong morals and a straightforward personality that seemed to pull the people around him closer. He neither seemed like the type of person to take advantage of someone's kindness or make high-maintenance requests. Rather, his requests somehow made others want to fulfill them. Forced as it was, her faint smile served as more than a significant answer. Magnolia's shopping district, although the week had just began, the farmer's market stalls introduced various fresh produce brought from the different towns of the continent. The shouts of entrepreneurs echoed and overlapped with one another all declaring just how great their prices and products were. Get your fresh loaves of honey bread here. 100 jewels per loaf. Basil Town's finest tomatoes over here. Freshest ones you'll find in Fury. Walking side by side, Fairy Tale's newest member and senior S-class mage maintained a brisk pace through the crowded street. While Mirajan remained impervious to the bombardment of offers and deals, Naruto on the other hand, was not so tactful. Young man, you absolute must try these barley town apples. Have a sample. Oh wow, this is really good. How much are they? They're only 300 jewels per pound. Great, I'll take fo. Ga. Standing beside Naruto with his cheek pinched between her fingers, Mirajan shifted her hollow stare towards the merchant who backed away almost immediately. Sorry, but we're not interested. Isn't that right, Naruto? The shinobi's cerulean orbs glanced to his side before he nervously laughed in response. Aya, Yao Aya White, can you please wet go of my cheek now? Mirajan complied and released the Uzumaki's cheek before choosing to grab the sleeve of his shirt instead. It's like you're trying to make this harder than it needs to be. She blandly stated as she pulled him through the crowd. Do you even have enough money to spend on anything that's not on the list you showed me? Who knows? The ninja grinned. I only have what the old man gave me. The whiskered teen pulled out a sack of coins before handing it to Mira for inspection. The mage opened the parcel doing a rough inspection before concluding it should be sufficient for what they were looking for. I'll hold on to this so you don't get distracted by any of the other merchants here. The blonde nodded giving his approval before stuffing his hands in his pockets while following closely behind her. Finding the first potato stand on the bustling street, the pair's arrival to the stand was noticed by its boisterous owner. The kind elderly woman gave a polite smile and waved before moving to tend to other customers swarming her stand. The list says a dozen so grab a twelve and let's move on. The shinobi's eyes monitored her facial expression carefully as it shifted back into its blank state. A mischievous grin spread across his lips as a new idea came to mind. Okay, leave it to me. Naruto energetically responded grabbing one of the shopping bags provided by the merchant. He then went to work finding his twelve potatoes. Mirajan stood a good distance away, arms crossed and eyes closed in thought. She had finally gotten a momentary period of peace no matter how short it was. Honestly, 
There had to be a limit to how helpless someone was when it came to shopping. Wow, look at all the food they're selling, Mira. Do you think we should buy something for Elfman? Mirajan's lips fell into tight-lipped frown while her left hand clenched itself tightly within its cast. Memories of her first trip here with her little sister resurfaced as her eyes traveled around the numerous stalls and people. The merchants and their products hadn't really changed over the years. Looking beside her to where another person usually accompanied her, she found the spot empty. Hey, Mirajan checked these out. Before her thoughts could darken any further, she was brought out of their inner reflection upon being greeted face to face with the boy who seemed like a representation of the sun in terms of brightness. Her attention was drawn towards the sizable pile of potatoes he held cradled in his arms before her eyes promptly shifted into an expression that was a mix of unamusement and disbelief. Naruto, she began as she grabbed one potato from his pile. Yes, please tell me how in the actual world you managed to pick the worst potatoes out of all of those. If the potato is green and soft, she demonstrated her point by squeezing the vegetable to the point her fingers made a temporary, yet visible indent. That means it wasn't grown properly and that it will probably taste bitter. The vegetables they sell here are usually always fresh, so again how did you even manage to find 12 of these? Naruto innocently blinked at Mirajan's incredulity before looking down at the potatoes he had chosen. I just found them and thought they looked pretty good. Mirajan sighed before leading Naruto back to the stall where she immediately made him place the potatoes back onto the racks holding them. Quickly and efficiently scanning over the selection, Myra's experienced eyes managed to pick out a dozen golden, brown potatoes that possessed a significantly more natural appearance than what Naruto had picked out. Grabbing each potato one by one before placing it into the bag, the handed the old lady a few coins before giving the bag of potatoes back to Naruto. She internally sighed hoping to get the shopping trip over and done with. Somewhere in Magnolia, two hours had passed since they arrived to the farmer's market before the two fairy tale wizards, or rather wizard and shinobi, finally finished. It was now late in the afternoon with both of the teens walking back to wherever Naruto was leading them to. Man, I'm really grateful you were there to help me out. Speaking of which, the blonde in question had a positively, bright smile on his whiskered features even as he carried three grocery bags in each hand filled to the brim with vegetables while one had meat. You, really don't go shopping at markets do you? E.H. What makes you say that? When we went to shop for carrots, you picked the slimiest and squishiest carrots out of the entire bunch. When we went to pick out the onions, you picked out the ones that were practically falling apart. And to top it all off, you managed to find nine of each one in a fresh market. Haha, I am pretty skilled aren't I? Naruto grinned at Mirajan's look of doubt. The snow-haired mage sighed and pinched the bridge of her nose. You have everything now don't you? I'll see you around. As she turned around to leave, she was suddenly stopped when a hand clasped onto her shoulder. She glanced around to see two cerulean blue eyes and a small smile being directed towards her. The place I'm heading to is that building over there. Naruto said pointing to an area that lied just behind a wall. Can you come with me for a bit? Mirajan sighed in response before speaking. Naruto, I. It'll only be for a bit and if you don't want to stay then you can leave. She just wanted to be alone. Mira lowered her crestfallen gaze to the ground, her eyes covered by the strands of her hair. She didn't want to talk to anyone. She didn't want to be near anyone. All she wanted was to be alone safe within the confines of her room. Every street, every building, and every person she saw around town only served to remind her of her sister, and with every reminder came a painful stab of pain in her chest. The three of them, Elfman, Lysina, and herself, had come to this town together. Growing up without parents had always been a rough experience, but they had gotten through it with the support of each other. Eventually, Magnolia had finally become a home to them while the people at Fairy Tale had become their family. Now with Lysina gone it was as if a large hole had been torn open in her heart. Looking at her broken arm, Mira doubted she could go on jobs even if her arm healed. With each passing day, she could feel her magic slipping away, as if it were water pouring out of a leak in a tank. Ira Jane she lightly gasped realizing that she had been completely oblivious to Naruto repeatedly calling out her name. She turned around and saw the eccentric teen take on a look of worry. Hey, are you okay? 
Why yeah, I'm fine. Mira answered as she shrugged off Naruto's hand on her shoulder. Sorry, I just had something on my mind. The shinobi's troubled stare made it blatantly clear that he didn't believe her. In an attempt to ease his suspicions, the ivory-haired takeover mage sought to change the subject. Oh oh, yeah, didn't you say the place we were heading to is just around the corner? Although his hands were both holding a handful of groceries, the Jinchuriki crossed his arms over his chest, a hint of concern lacing the corners of his eyes. Are you sure? Seeing her hastily nod in the affirmative, the reincarnation of Asura led her to the entrance to the area behind the wall. Looking over the wall, the Strauss sisters' expression turned into that of surprise upon recognizing the building as a local church. The church was surrounded by a grayish stone wall that appeared to have been cleaned recently. Engraved over its iron-barred gates was a cross matching the sculpted version that had been placed on the church's roof. The building itself looked aged in comparison to the newer structures in Magnolia, yet it still maintained an image of fortitude and endurance. I'm back, Naruto called out as he kicked open the gates before letting himself inside. As Mirajan followed behind him, the two of them were greeted by an elderly priest dressed in rather colorful garments along with tall papal hat. The man emitted an aura of warmth and generosity as he chuckled heartily at the youth's eccentric entrance. Welcome back, Naruto. I trust that you were able to buy the ingredients for tonight. Upon entering, Myra's gaze had wandered around and observed its surroundings. From the dusty ground to the patches of grass, the church possessed a rarely found tranquil atmosphere. The shinobi apologetically grinned holding up the bags of groceries. To be honest, I would have had a little trouble without Mirajan's help here. Father Brock's sincerity filled eyes shifted towards Mira as the man lowered his head in thanks. You have my thanks as well, young one. Ah, it really wasn't much. Mirajan immediately responded waving her hands for emphasis. At that moment, Myra's attention was drawn towards the sight of a new arrival who emerged from the inside of the church. The familiar head of striking blonde hair and ocean blue eyes were too similar to mistaken for anyone else. Oh, you're finally back. The new arrival spoke as Mirajan's eyes slowly widened. She blinked once. She blinked twice. She even closed and rubbed her eyes for good measure as she looked to the blonde standing next to her and what seemed like his identical twin in front of them. Knowing the exact feeling Mirajan was experiencing, Brock chuckled in mirth while the two Naruto's observed a frenzied Mira with barely concealed amusement. H how? What? Why? I mean, how are there two of you? Hey, boss where should I put these? The newly revealed clone holding the groceries asked, while presently ignoring Mirajan's Minblown state. The original Naruto that had been in the church for the entirety of the day took the vegetables from his copy's hands before directing his head towards the complex's courtyard. For now can you go help the others with the kids? I'll go set up in the kitchen. You got it. As the clone ran off to find his fellow brethren, Father Brock spun back around to head back into the church. I'm going to check up on how your other selves are progressing with the repairs. Once again, thank you for your help. Nah, don't mention it. I wouldn't have a place to stay if it weren't for you, old man. The partner of the Kayubi waved goodbye to the priest before finally turning to address a shell-shocked Mirajan. The girl's jaw was slightly dropped while her eyes were wide with shock. A few strands of her hair seemed to be sticking out perfectly defining just how flustered she was. Motioning for her to come closer, his trademark grin didn't seem bothered by how unnerved she was after seeing just one of his clones. He didn't blame her really. Although the technique wasn't commonly used in the elemental nations, its reputation had been so vast and widespread that there wasn't a single shinobi who didn't know of it. On the other hand after asking Father Brock about any similar magic, the closest thing that existed to the shadow clone technique in this world was something called a thought projection and even then it was extraordinarily limited in application. Come on in, I could use the extra help. The Jinchuriki spoke garnering Mirajan's attention. Returning back to Earthland, the ivory-haired woman finally regained her sense of speech managing to articulate just how confused she was. Hold it, are you not going to explain what the hell that was? Watching her wildly gesture towards the direction his clone headed off to, the shinobi chuckled before leaning his back against the door frame. I don't mind answering some questions as long as you help me make some food for these kids. I could always use a fourth set of hands. Fourth. 
Mira confusedly repeated, Ah ah ah, help first then questions later. Albeit reluctantly, the eldest Strauss nodded agreeing to the whiskered boy's terms and followed him inside. Upon entering through the main door, Mirajan's facial expression immediately changed to one of surprise seeing five other clones interacting alongside at least a dozen children with ages varying from 6 to 12. After turning around the corner and entering an opening within the stone and plaster wall, Mira found a courtyard on the left side of the church's building. It was a wide and open space with a couple trees strewn about yet with children everywhere. Performing a rough headcount, the S-Class wizard found at least one clone accompanying each group of three kids. The multiple copies played games like freeze tag and hide and seek with the younger kids, joyful laughter melodiously resounding along with the sight like a symphony. Even she couldn't stop the small smile that spread across her lips at the sight. Standing on the church's roof, another set of five clones were shouting out orders to one another as they took apart old, moldy boards from the roof before replacing them fresh new ones. I didn't know you were so devoted to the church here. Mirajan's sweat dropped watching the clones work with flair and vigor. Oh, I'm not a member of the church. Naruto paused to let that sink in right before Mirajan's gaze snapped towards Naruto almost immediately. Come again, she spoke in disbelief. Naruto sheepishly laughed while scratching the side of his cheek with his left index finger. I was actually wandering around town when the old man here saw me and decided to let me stay for the night. I noticed that a lot of parts here were starting to wear out so I made an agreement to help out around here in exchange for a place to sleep. Arriving to their destination, Naruto stepped through the door into a building next to the courtyard with Mirajan in tow. The building was a large kitchen with a rectangular table in the center while the surrounding areas had ovens, stoves, and various kitchen utensils lining the walls. I'm Ba, oof. Almost immediately after they entered, Mirajan had to step to the side to avoid Naruto from toppling over her. Standing safely to the side, Mirajan found the reason for the blonde's fall lying on top of said blonde. Yay, you're back. Lying down on top of his chest was a small girl who appeared to be no older than eleven with dark brown hair tied over her shoulder in a single ponytail and bright violet eyes. Geez, Hina stopped tackling Naruto when you see him. A male voice chided. Joining the group was a boy with coral pink hair, sharp yellow eyes, and a pair of glasses. He appeared to be at least one year older than his friend yet maintained an air of maturity in contrast. But this one's the real one, Ko. The boy sighed out of a sense of resignation before he noticed an unfamiliar face. Hum, who are you? With two pairs of eyes on Mirajan, the shinobi on the ground decided to speak up for her. Mirajan meet my two helpers. The overly responsible stick in the mud over there is Kojura Shinomiya. He usually handles the cooking and preparations for old man Brock. Ignoring Kojura's annoyed glare, the Uzumaki carried on with the introductions as he looked down on the girl who was currently nuzzling her face into his shirt. He sighed before he pulled both of her face's cheeks lifting it up to face his. Gah, and the little troublemaker right here is Hanako Anui. She's his assistant chef. He, I don't quasi too able. Naruto and Kojura's simultaneous disbelieving stares proved her argument otherwise. Mawost of da time, releasing her cheeks, Naruto sighed and ruffled her hair playfully, Hanako enjoying the gesture immensely. You're lucky you're endearing, you know. When Hanako was going to respond, she suddenly stopped noticing the presence of an attractive lady in the room and effectively clammed up. Anyway, these two have apparently been cooking for the orphanage since they got here, so I think they'll be able to handle the work. Kojura crossed his arms over his chest while adjusting his glasses so that they sat on the bridge of his nose. If anything, I'm more worried that this vagrant's going to mess something up. He stated, fully directing his comment towards Naruto. The ninja simply grinned as he lifted a petulantly sulking Hanako off of him. Anyway, I know you three will get along so let's get started. Oi, can you really not cook? Kojura shouted. Kojura groaned and sighed muttering something about a freeloading hobo before holding his hand out towards Mira. Nice to meet you, Mirajan. You can call me, Kojura. Clasping the hand, the snow-haired beauty shook hands with intelligent youth. Likewise and just Mira is fine. Kojura nodded before crossing his arms over his chest while directing a bland glare towards the girl who currently standing awestruck in front of Mira. Hanako, 
Do I need to remind you that it's rude not to introduce yourself and it's even more rude to stare at guests? True to his words, Hanako was indeed staring at no one other than Mirajan. Violet eyes bore onto Sapphire as tiny hands reached out and balled themselves tightly while her grip on Naruto's shirt tightened. Hey, Naruto, she called out still staring at a slightly perturbed Mirajan. The blonde poked Hanako's cheek yet did not earn a response in the slightest. Somewhat unsettled as well, he responded with a hint of hesitation in his tone. Um, yes. Hanako's head whirled towards Naruto while literal stars flashed in her eyes. That lady's super pretty, is she your G-I-R-L-F-R-I-E-N, Kya? Before she could finish her question, she was promptly flicked on the forehead by the whiskered world traveler who lifted her off of himself. Hina, Naruto began in a manner similar to a scolding parent. Don't be rude and introduce yourself properly. Seeing the unyielding stare directed towards her, Hanako bowed out and conceded. She looked towards an entertained Mirajan before lowering her head in apology. Hanako Anui, that's better, Naruto said as he dusted himself off. He picked up the groceries he had set down prior to being tackled and moved them to the large island table in the center of the kitchen. All right, Kojura and Hina can you guys take care of the onions and carrots? Yep, leave it to us, Hanako confidently answered flashing Naruto a grin and thumbs up. Naruto's expectant gaze shifted towards Kojura who nodded readily. And I'll make sure she doesn't blow up the kitchen and us with it. Expression utterly serious, Naruto gave Kojura a thumbs up as well. Yash, I leave it to you, Kojura. You guys are so mean. Kojura chuckled before pushing Hina along towards the second sink in the kitchen while carrying the bags of carrots and onions with him. Yeah, yeah, let's go Hina. And make sure you guys wash your hands. Naruto called out as they left. And what will our job be? Mirajan asked while sliding a hair tie off of her wrist. She used the band to tie her hair up in a ponytail behind her head as a precaution to avoid any accidents in the kitchen. Hefting the large sack of potatoes onto the counter, Naruto began to put them into a large collective bowl. Our job will be washing and skinning the potatoes. He answered before moving to the sink and washing his hands. Looking at the ingredients on the table, I'm guessing we're going to be making curry rice for the kids. Mirajan asked as she followed after Naruto to wash her own hands. Yep, I'm not exactly a great cook, but I won't let you beat me. Naruto challengingly grinned. As Mirajan picked up the skinner and held it in her hand, a particular fragment of a memory resurfaced in her mind. I challenge you to a cooking showdown, Mirane. Mirajan softly smiled before grabbing the first potato to start. Just watch me. A couple hours later, it's so good. Thank you, Naruto. Seconds please. After finishing the cooking, Naruto's clones had used some of the spare wood from roof reparations to build a large picnic table that managed to fit at least 10 people on each side. Each row was packed with children all eating the homemade meal from small bowls thanks to Naruto, Mira, Kojura, and Hanako. Father Brock stood by the food table managing servings while making sure each child got to eat. Sitting away from the table, Naruto and Mirajan watched with empty bowls sitting in their laps as they sat next to each other while leaning on one of the courtyard's trees. Man, you really know your way around a kitchen, Naruto said with a sigh of satisfaction. It's my loss. Looking over to his left side, he saw Mirajan staring into her empty dish, quietly stirring in her own thoughts. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, I'll gladly answer them. A promise is a promise, you know. Resting his hands behind his head, the shinobi relaxed into the almost nostalgic feeling of cool bark pressed against his skin. Mirajan's head rose up and looked towards the lackadaisical blonde before recalling her question from earlier in the day. T then, can you tell me how you made those copies of yourself? I've never seen anything like that before. It's called the shadow clone technique. Naruto smiled in reminiscence. And right now it's an ability unique to me alone. You alone. Mirajan curiously repeated. What do you mean by that? Calm blue eyes drifting towards the gently flowing leaves, the ninja smiled in amusement deciding to regale the girl with slightly altered tales of the truth. Well, Mirajan, I guess you could say I'm a little bit different than the average mage. The place where I came from had a lot of skills like the ones you guys have here, but there are a lot of different ones as well. I see. 
Mira quietly murmured after deciding to accept the rather ambiguous response. Also why do you always call me Mirajan? Naruto tilted his head, slightly confused, and adopted an expression curiosity. What do you mean? You always use my full name when no one else does. It would be a lot easier to call me Mira instead. I see. The blonde faintly chuckled. Well then Mira, do you have anything else you want to ask? As Mirajan thought about it, there had always been one particular question that had constantly tugged on the edges of her mind. It had come up time and time again whenever she ran into the Uzumaki, yet she could never figure out its answer. Why? It was a single word but with a limitless amount of answers. She had neither yelled the word nor did she mumble it. It was short, clear, and easily heard. Why what? Naruto repeated slightly unsettled at the sudden and abstruse question. Why are you doing all this? Walking me home, asking me to help you with things like shopping, trying to show me someplace like this. What are you trying to do? There was a hint of anxiousness and desperation laced into her tone, a stark contrast to the Jinchuriki's unchanging and calm demeanor. It's easy really, I'm just fulfilling a promise. Promise? What do you mean by that? Mira asked caught off guard by the cryptic answer. Whose promise are you fulfilling? She felt a sudden pang of pain within her chest at the thought that he was only doing this out of a sense of obligation at the very thought that he wouldn't have bothered talking to her if someone hadn't asked him to. Who asked you to do this? The snow-haired woman despondently murmured, eyes covered by the fringe of her hair. Someone who cares about you. The shinobi tenderly smiled. The successor of the sage placed a hand on Mirajan's shoulder. For the young mage, as soon as the blonde's hand made contact she felt her surroundings completely shift. In one moment she felt the support of the old tree behind her and heard the continuous laughter of the church orphanage's children, and the next everything had changed. The presence of the tree faded away in the blink of an eye as if it never existed. The sounds of the kids and merriment were gone, and in their place settled an eerie silence. Mirajan Strauss was no longer in church's courtyard. She was no longer anywhere near Magnolia in fact. Standing up while sweeping her gaze over her new surroundings, her eyes widened as the familiarity and significance of the place dawned upon her. The handiwork of the small, straw hut couldn't have been mistaken for anyone else's besides hers. Along with the grave engraved with her name, I once had a friend who I considered to be my brother in everything but blood. Mirajan suddenly stiffened remembering the person who had somehow in some way brought her here. She turned and watched as the person she previously thought she knew more about than anyone at the guild approached the beautifully made grave and crouched down in front of it. His voice carried over the mountain like a calming wind after a storm and the tenderness he exhibited could match even the sun with its warmth. He was arrogant, annoying, and a total pain in the neck. Naruto chuckled in remembrance, but he was still the person I considered my best friend. The Uzumaki's eyes gained a tinge of regret and heaviness as the image of his worn and bloody teammate appeared in his mind. However, one day the village gave his older brother a mission that resulted in the deaths of their entire family. The person who I thought was my friend lost himself to his grief and became obsessed with his revenge. He lost his entire family and was swallowed up by his pain eventually leaving him trapped in the dark. Standing to his full height, he walked towards Mirajan until he was no more than a few steps away. His features, kind and full of life, were face to face with her stunned disposition. I made a promise to myself that I never wanted to see anyone else suffer like he did. And, he looked back at the grave made by Lysina's closest friend, its splendidly crafted details basking in the warmth of the sun. I also made a promise to Lysina that I would make sure you didn't give up being a wizard, too. Myra's honest sapphire blue eyes revealed their astonishment as her jaw slightly fell in sheer wonder. You, you knew about my magic. Ha ha, I can't take credit for that. Naruto good-naturedly grinned. Urza's the one who noticed. Urza, Mirajan asked with visible bewilderment. Naruto nodded before speaking again. She doesn't want to lose a precious rival and friend. Mirajan bit the bottom of her lip while her right arm moved to cradle her broken left. Her eyes looked lost and dim, refusing to meet his own. I, I don't want to endanger or get anyone else killed ever again. She quietly muttered choking back a hiccup. I don't want to be a mage that will only get the people close to her hurt. I know you don't. Mirajan inclined her head upwards as two hands placed themselves on her shoulders. 
Coming face to face with a pair of the most fervent and animated ocean blue eyes, she found herself lost in the face of just how certain the tone of the shinobi's voice was. But I won't let you quit. I may have not been able to meet Lysina, but I know for sure that she wouldn't want her older sister to blame herself and live like this. Tears gathered at the corners of the silver-haired mage's eyes while her hands balled themselves tightly. Her entire frame started to shake as it held itself from falling apart altogether. But I, Mira Ney, a recollection from four years ago, only a couple days after they had left their village, arose within Mirajan's memories. Four years ago, Mira Ney, what's wrong? A younger listener, bright blue eyes filled with pure curiosity, stood in front of her older sister who was currently sitting on an old stump in the forest they were venturing through. Mirajan had hidden herself away in an overly large cloak as if to hide her existence away from the outside world. Beneath the opening in the front of the garment, one demonic right arm rested on her leg. Not receiving a response from her sister, Lysina placed her hands on her hips while her expression adopted a pouting manner. Take this, ouch, what the heck, Lysina. Mirajan used her right hand to hold her left shoulder that had been the victim of Lysina's pinch. She had been stewing in her own thoughts when, out of the blue, her baby sister decided to pinch her shoulder for no apparent reason. Grinning proudly with a triumphant air about her, Lysina stood tall and proud, well as tall as a kid her age could stand. Don't you see, Mirane? Slightly annoyed, Mirajan grumpily directed a small glare towards the little girl. See what? Pointing her small finger directly into her face, Lysina spoke with a voice of pride and liveliness. A monster wouldn't have been phased by my attack, but you still said, ouch. Her cute sister was practically sparkling with a shining gleam in her eyes, fully believing in the fact that she was right. At the moment, she still had control over her body, but it still didn't reassure her in the slightest. It was only a matter of when, not if, she fully turned into a demon. Mirajan lowered her head in self-deprecation, idly touching the scales upon her right hand. She was afraid. That's only for now, listen up. What if I really do turn into a monster and hurt you or Elfman? Lysina smiled brightly and held her sister's cheeks with her significantly smaller hands. Mushing together Mirajan's face to the point it looked too funny not to laugh, Lysina answered her sister's worries with her most honest answer. Even if you hurt me or Elfman, we'll both forgive you. You're our big sister and neither of us want you to give up, so promise. Face still being held by her little sister, Mirajan gave Lysina a questioning stare in response. Pwamai's what? Eyes fully serious despite holding Mirajan in a rather ridiculous manner, Lysina brought her face even closer so that Mirajan could practically see the resolve burning in her eyes. Promise that you won't give up on yourself, no matter what or else I won't let you go. Sighing audibly, Mirajan softly smiled and nodded. She pulled her sister's hands off of her face, so that she could wrap her up in a hug surprising even Lysina. All right, all right, you win. It's a promise, Lysina. Now, as he held onto her shoulders, all of a sudden Naruto felt the shaking in Mirajan's arms and legs cease on its own. Adopting an expression of confusion, his facial features immediately changed into that of unadulterated surprise upon being hugged by Mirajan who wrapped her one good arm around him. Feeling a slight burning in his cheeks, the whiskered shinobi tried his best to make sure that he wasn't aggravating her injury in any way. H. Hey Mira, what's wrong? Are you Oka? If, Mirajan slowly began. Naruto blinked, repeating the same word she had mumbled. If, if you and Lysina met, I think you two would be good friends. Mirajan finished murmuring into his shirt. Releasing the shell shocked and stunned Naruto, Mirajan's gaze matched the Uzumaki's with a newly found hope radiating within it. Hey, what would you have done if I decided to stop being a mage anyway? Naruto scratched the back of his head as he hadn't fully thought out what he would have done if she did say no. Well, I probably would have grabbed my pebbles back from the river and restarted at square one. The Jinchuriki blinked coming to the realization of what Mirajan's words had meant. Wait, does this mean? Smiling brightly before he could finish his sentence, Mirajan bowed her head in a manner similar to that of a student. It means I'll be in your care. Naruto. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.